Yes, the trials and tribulations of uh, World Cycling Productions Classic Race, and here we go again, the season 2010. I'm Phil Liggett, back in the saddle in tandem with me is, of course, Paul Sherwin. He's some winners of the Omelope Het Nieuwsblad. It changed its name a year ago from the old Het Volk, and uh, based, as always, in Ghent in Belgium. As the riders sign in and make way now for their first attempt to tackle the bergs of the Flanders region. George Hincapie sporting the Stars and Stripes, champion of the United States. He likes this part of the world. He's a former winner of Ghent Wavel game, as is this man as well, Marcus Burkhardt. And not a bad day for the month of February after a very cold winter here in Europe. This is Alessandro Balan, a new signing by Team BMC, greatly strengthened this year, of course, with the arrival of new world champion Cadell Evans, Bernard Eisel, HTC Columbia. He's a rider who spends a lot of his career still working for others. A Russian champion, uh, Sergei Ivanov. All smiling, all looking forward to a new season. The new team on the block is Sky, as Juan Antonio Fletcher signs in. Or he had a bit of success in uh, the Southern Hemisphere in Australia in the early part of the season. And it's a team looking to, to ride themselves into the history books this year. Yes, a little bit of a weather shock for the riders today. Those riders who did go down to the Tour Down Under, now coming out of Australia's summer uh, to early spring. And I mean early spring here in Belgium. But this is a classic race over 200 kilometres. It's a long way at this time of the year. Yeah, a lot of nervousness. Uh, everybody regards this as being the start of the season. Uh, one of the Radio Shack riders coming in. Uh, this man is a very good sprinter. And he's a guy that I think Lance Armstrong will be counting on when we go through to the Tour de France. Well, this is a moment now here in Belgium. The atmosphere coming off a cyclocross season, which is the most popular winter sport here in Belgium. Now making way for the interest of the summer road racing season. Of course, we stay in Belgium a lot now until we go through April for the classics, uh, where riders tend to make a name for themselves. The others thinking of the big tours, uh, they'll just uh, slowly, slowly, and look for the form around May, June time. Thomas Vikers there from Radio Shack. Radio Shack fielding a very strong team. Uh, Nick Noyens as well for uh, Team Rabobank, and uh, the winner of last year, Tor Hushoft. Yes, smiling Tor Hushoff, the conquering Norwegian, now a two-time winner of the green jersey in the Tour de France, the old Norwegian to win the green points jersey in that race. This is a man who could ride well today, Henrik Hausler. I still haven't figured out for whether he's German or whether he's actually Australian. <laughs> and of course, he is Australian, that's Robbie McEwen. Yes, young McEwen showing uh, signs of a return to top form after his injury as the champion of Belgium signs in here, Tom Bonin. Also coming off the bad boy books with his cocaine, but let's hope he has a good season. This is the route they face uh, as they roll away from Ghent, little journey around before they hit the hills. Yes, the hills come very early on in Omelut Het Nieuwsblad. It starts with the Leiberg, Berendries, uh, Ten Boss, and of course, uh, climb number six is the one that everybody fears, the Mur de Gramont, followed by the Pottelberg, Kreisberg. Then they make their way back with many of the climbs that the riders will face in the later on in the season, Ronde van Vlaanderen. But it's a long way back to Ghent after the Molenberg. Yes, welcome to the Bergs of Flanders here as the riders now coming off a very cold winter where they've had to go to warmer climbs to do their training. And uh, Peter van Pietingham there chatting away, former winner of the event with some of the riders. Uh, Eric Zabel also, he coaches Mark Cavendish, by the way. Kevin Hulsman's down there for Team Quickstep. This is the start of the season, and uh, for these riders, it's a very important rendezvous. Many of them have trained all over the world, whether it's Australia, whether it's uh, Malaysia, or whether it's even just training in California to get themselves ready for this. Well, it wouldn't be Belgium without rain. It was a wet start. We've moved out onto the course now. We're 74 kilometres from the end. We've had the early morning breakaway going clear. After 10 kilometres, Frédéric Vachulin of Vacances Soleil, Frédéric Guedon, the man that keeps on popping in with big wins like Paris Tour and Paris Roubaix, Roy Curvers from Skill Shimano and Roger Kluger, who really is a rising young star on the Mill Ramps. God, there's a crash here. Well, somebody's gone down hard there from Team Cofidis. Uh, we're looking at that breakaway, Phil, having a gap of 5 minutes and 40 seconds over the front end of the main field. But I don't think the race has really yet started in earnest. Well, this man's totally incognito at the moment. I must confess I don't recognise him, but he must have painted his legs brown. Oh, there we are. Was well, he in uh, Stannard? No, it's not. It's Lenz uh, Kirkelier who's uh, just getting back on his bike, but I think he must have been under a lamp because it's been... Oh, it's rust. It's probably rust with all the rain throughout the winter. This well, is how it happened, I think. 
Well, uh, it just you see the roads in Belgium are extremely dangerous. It was probably that just at the side of the road there, there's a little gap in yeah. the cement, and very often a rider's wheel will get caught in that, and this man went down, and you notice how everybody else just managed to avoid him. Yes, well, he's learning how hard the Belgian roads are here, and uh, is he going to get back now? There's a question. The peloton is sitting at 5 minutes 38. The breakaway has thinned a little bit. I think it's down to three. I'm still at four riders. Here they are now. We're catching up with them. I gave you the names earlier. Gaydon is sat at the back just for the moment. Uh, Kluger in the light blue, slipping away from the left of the action. And uh, second line is uh, Verschulen and setting the pace at the moment, Roy Curvers. They got away after 10 kilometres. There was a sort of a spirited chase by three riders, Johnny Hogeland, uh, uh, Gregory Habo from uh, the local team, Verdanus, and uh, David Boucher, but they gave up in the end under the impetus of the break, and now more or less all back together at 5.36. Still time to put it to rights. Well, this is the climb of the Pottelberg. It's an average 7.5%, not very steep, but you can see how narrow this road is, and that's why sometimes it's an, an advantage to be in a breakaway in these early season races, because otherwise it's total chaos in the main field behind. That's Gedon on the left-hand side, a former winner, as you mentioned, Phil, of Parry Tours, but I think it was the win that he had in Paris roubaix a number of years ago that really rose him to prominence. He's an amazing character, actually. He, he keeps up popping in. He's getting on a bit now. Uh, he's one of the few riders to say he's, uh, he's near almost the same age as Lance Armstrong. He's 38 years of age. And um, he had a sixth once in the Tour de Flanders, which is in this region, over these roads. So he's a northern France rider, which means he's used to some bad roads in the area. These are wonderful racing roads, one has to say. Well, he's very motivated, really, by the team uh, team, cha team captain, who is uh, Mark Madio. Madio, a two-time winner of Paris-Roubaix. He seems to be able to motivate his riders all of the time for these races in the, the northern part of Europe. Good pace making, but take a look at the faces. The boys are under pressure here now. Remember, 204 kilometres is a long way as they start to stretch those legs at this time of the year. They'll have been hard pushed to find six- and seven-hour rides coming off the winter we've had in Europe. The coldest winter for over 30 years in Great Britain, I can testify to that, but basically I was lucky enough to escape too to Australia and the Tour Down Under. Roy Curve is on the front here now for Skill Shimano, a team that was uh, very aggressive in the Tour de France last year, and that's probably one of the reasons why they're looking to these races to get their name to prominence again, because they'll be looking for another wildcard selection into the Tour de France, a uh, uh, wildcard selection list which should come out in about a month's time. Yes, and... Uh, well, last year, Skill Shimano went to their first Tour de France and rode pretty well. They tried to get in most of the moves, just to let the organisers know they were capable of competing in that three-week event. Roy Curvers is the representative up front today in the early morning breakaway. Blimey, we got away to such an early morning attack after 10 kilometres. They've been out here all day. Now these guys are seriously hoping to get themselves some television time but they've still got a good 71 kilometres to go to the finish and the main field hasn't really started to, to really grind it down. They will I think start to organise the chase a little later on. Obviously there's a lot of pressure on the farmer Farmer Lotto, the squad, the Belgian squad, which has to come up with some results. They're regarded as the flagship, but they've always got this big rivalry with Team Quickstep. And without Cadell Evans this time around because he's now been snapped up by BMC and uh, when Cadell won his world championship so well in Mendricio it was a terrific breakaway best man won for sure that world title the Australians getting their first ever world professional road race champion we always expected McEwen to do that his best was a silver though no chance to dodge a car that's a shame well it was off the road I guess but this is HTC Columbia on the road and a little bit of a sting in the ribs I think no, he went down very hard there. Another rider in that uh, little crash there with the BMC racing was John Murphy, and he's just up there on the left-hand side of the road. Well, check the wheels first. Have a little look at this. It's where the car is. So it's the, the new young American, actually, TJ Van Garderen, who went down there. He's learning the ropes uh, very early on in these races. Well, he's a good prospect. They've just taken him on board, and uh, he is a very, very good rider. Second in the Tour de l'Avenir. Uh, so that's why they've signed him on. He's a stage racer, more than a, a rider of a one-day, at the moment anyway, as a one-day rider. The big problem you see on these very narrow roads in Belgium, you have to wait for your team car to come up to service you sometimes. You could be standing at the side of the road for anything up to two, two and a half minutes, especially if the main field has been stretched out on a cobblestone section. Well, this is the danger of Flanders, are the narrow roads and the peloton breathing in to keep on these narrow roads. But it means you've got to be strong, and if you've got any ambitions of the day, you've got to hold your position at the front of that peloton, because as you can see, you get an easier ride 
as you block off nobody can get past you but as you can see at the moment there is no organized chase at the front end of the main field everybody's very happy just to sit in the first 15 to 20 places to try and make sure they're avoiding those silly crashes and incidents that happen halfway down the main field but the chase will come a little bit later on and I have a feeling it could probably come from Team Quickstep because Tom Bonin, I think, after his sortie to uh, Qatar and, and, Do and Doha, I think will be looking to try and get himself a victory in this race. He is, of course, Phil, let's not forget, a specialist in these races, having won previously the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. Absolutely right. Incidentally, the break is coming down by second at a time, but it was at one stage 12 minutes ahead. Lost a couple of minutes when uh, the breakaway was stopped at a railroad crossing and the peloton continued on which is uh, unlucky for the breakaway the international rules state that if uh, the leaders are stopped they're stopped if the breakaway was very close to the peloton they would probably stop the peloton and restart with a time gap but it was too big of a gap at 12 minutes to do that and the peloton didn't get stopped at the crossing so they did lose a little bit anyway onto the Pottelberg these are the hills now and they come thick and fast now as we're down into the uh, deepest Flanders region and this is what I think the field are waiting for. They'll start to steadily now close down this breakaway. Interesting to note, Sky right at the very front end of the main field, they've got a big chance with Juan Antonio Fletcher and the whole team I think are dedicated to him. And it's quite a rare man, uh, the Spanish rider from uh, the northern part of Spain. He loves racing in these cobble classics, which normally is something that the Spanish riders do not enjoy at all. Yeah, it looked like Russ Downing was number one man on the Sky team, just the second wheel at the moment. Uh, he's relishing his big chance now, having uh, shown terrific talent on small teams in the UK. Sky have given him the chance he's waited for, and that's to race for a top team. And, you know, this is a man that rode so well in last year's Tour of Ireland, take victory, he's been the king of the mountains in the Tour of Ireland, and at last a big team has signed him up. He's got his big moments this year, and it's all down to him now. There he is on the front. Well, it's, very, it's quite amazing when you get a brand new team to get the team to gel together to work when you bring a, together a number of different units from all over the globe and all of a sudden this team clicked very early on in the first race they actually participated in the Cancer Classic in Adelaide in South Australia. They came up with a very good lead out and they got the first win of the season for them and I think that's a great way to start. Quick step, number one team in Belgium but uh, need some good results this year to maintain that slot I think the white jersey of the Russian champion he's won that title six times uh, Sergei Ivanov in the red shorts there Garmin. he could be a danger Paul. he could be he likes these kind of races Garmin transitions over on the right hand side as well with the orange shoulders they'll be looking after them and Tyler Farah who's got a very good sprint and he's already had a fair amount of success this season but he would too like to try and see whether or not he can rival the classic teams Air from Chipotle to Slipstream and this year it's Garmin Transitions that will make the headway through the big tours. They're still uh, stinging a little bit after the loss of Bradley Wiggins. A rather sordid affair but in the end Wiggins crossing over after his fourth place finish in last year's Tour de France to the new Sky team. That's his main target of course. And Sky saying they want a British winner of the Tour within five years. That's a big target. Um, and they haven't got the riders they actually wanted in the team yet because a lot of them are still under contract uh, but they did manage to pinch a couple Ben Swift was another one from Katusha they were also unhappy at the head hunting that went on uh, but Sky now are in the frame as a top team and I'm saying that Paul without them winning much at all just yet Oh, but uh, they, they started off looking very good in the Tour Down Under and that was Michael Barry riding at the front end for them, the Canadian rider. He's uh, a good asset as well. They've built a very strong team and yes, I agree, they haven't got all of the riders they want because many riders are under multiple year contracts. But slowly but surely they will pick them up. A little incident at the back here. Well, the Pottelberg, I was about to say, didn't do too much damage, but the Vacon Soleil rider off the that's, back. That's Roman Felu there, who's had a bit of a problem there. And he was a, a great star in the Tour de France last year. These are one of the, the tiny little mechanical incidents that happen uh, every kilometre on these Belgian roads. Just uh, let's have a look at how it happened. Slipper gears, perhaps. Oh, he's on the right-hand side of the road. He's the, uh, he's the sprinter of the family. His brother Bryce is the climber. And... Uh, little adjustment of his computer sender by the look of it 508 good tempo riding now starting to come down 66 kilometers to go about 42 miles uh, but the thing is the hills and the Mieux de Gramont or Mieux de Gerardsbergen uh, are waiting them shortly and surely that's where they'll make the final move 
Well, there's still no urgency in the main field. You can see uh, fairly relaxed faces. Everybody's waiting for the moment to start, and uh, they will know that, that that group of riders at the front who've been away since the 10th kilometer of the event will start to, to weaken. It's a long call to race, race 204 kilometers in the start of the season, mm. especially in these cold weather conditions that most of the riders, as we've said, have been in warm conditions. Boonen, <laughs> number one, Fritjus. <laughs> well, I think uh, we can certainly agree with that. Tom Boonen is one of the best bike riders in the world, and. Uh, a little bit of chaos here, Phil. He's the chips, uh, or the French fries, depends on what language you speak. And that's the way to go around the corner, all over the road. But they've got the right side, it seems. You see the crowds down there now, and these are really quite dangerous situations, those unsighted bollards in the middle of the road here. But they managed to get through them, but they're not racing at the moment. That's the only thing it can be said in the favour of that situation. There's the safety jogger. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't beat the belt. Safety jogger standing in the middle of the road. He's doing his best. And there's a motorbike parked there uh, just to cause extra confusion. It's his, I suppose. Yeah, a bit of, bit of chaos here. But you can see everybody seems to have negotiated those little, uh, those little natural yeah. hazards quite well and got themselves back up to the front end of the main field. There's been one or two bad accidents happened on these classics with clipping these motorbikes and, and uh, motor cars that get parked off the road. But the riders tend to use everything, cycle paths, uh, whatever they can find to get to the front. Moments are desperate at times. No hold bars in the sport of professional cycling, especially when you know you have to get to the front end of the main field. And if you want to be a spectator, that's probably the best way to watch. Those yeah, men on the right hand side are on a club run. They're probably the guys who got their entry back, I would think. They're now just trying to prove they were worthy of riding in Het Newsblad. Changed its name from Het Volk uh, because Het Newsblad uh, bought out Het Volk newspaper, so they, uh, they took over the title. Sky doing a lot of work here to prove themselves worthy of the peloton, I think. They need a good performance uh, in these early season events to confirm a place in the Tour de France. It is far from certain at this moment, although one feels with Bradley Wiggins on the squad, that will be the icing on the cake. If they hadn't assigned Wiggins or managed to persuade uh, Garmin to let him go, which they didn't really want to, um, they may not have been looking forward to a Tour de France place, but they th I think they can now. Well, that's all to be revealed a little later on in the season. Uh, certainly, I think the addition of Brad Wiggins uh, takes him up to a higher echelon. Yeah. But I think there was some uh, there was some ill blood in the transfer of Wiggins across to Team Sky during those uh, winter months. I'm certain there was, and uh, I think money must have changed hands. How much we will never know because uh, both sides sworn to secrecy. But I think we're talking a few bob and well in excess of a million dollars. You see the arms going up there, these cars parked at the side of the road. These riders are putting their arms up to give the indication to other riders behind that there's a, a dangerous uh, art machine parked somewhere in the road. You see the people running off there. These, these are the professional spectators and they'll try and watch the Het Volk race as many times as they can. They'll park the car in a, a very strategic place so they can get away quickly, cut across the course and see the race again in 15 or 20 minutes. Well, there's a nasty bit of dust blowing around out there now, which is very typical of Belgium cycling and leads to uh, horrible little eye problems like conjunctivitis uh, from these dust storms that swirl around, uh, mud in the eye. I remember when I lived in Belgium, that was a common complaint with the cyclists with all the dirt flying off these roads. Sam Bewley sitting at the back here for Radio Shack. This red jersey is a new jersey on the circuit this year. Radio Shack, team put together by Lance Armstrong to uh, try and see if he can win the Tour de France an eighth time towards the end, of, towards the middle of this year. Probably the last time I would expect it'll be the last time that he will participate in the Tour de France because he is now getting right up there at 38 years of age, but still very aggressive. Well, I said that at a dinner not long ago and Lance was sitting in the front row and I said, well, you should all go to the Tour de France this year because it's the last time you'll see Lance Armstrong riding it. And he just gave me that typical Armstrong quizzical look and he goes, huh? <laughs> and uh, to which I gather that if he had a good Tour de France this year, he'll be back again next year at 39 years of age. Uh, but that's all in the future. The gap here down to 448, 64 kilometres to go. The real climbs are still ahead of the peloton. But take a look at the front now. A lot more urgency there. High tempo riding from Boy Telecom on the right. Radio Shack are mixing in there. Uh, Sky particularly in those black jerseys. I have to say, Paul, I didn't like the, the jerseys when they were launched. Uh, but they actually are terrific on television. No, they're very easy to pick out. There's the champion of Belgium's jersey as well, right at the front end of the main field. Tom Bonin is starting to be that.
that little bit more attentive he'll soon call his teammates to the front I don't think they'll want to start the chase behind those four riders until around about 40 kilometers to go and that's when we'll see the race really start to pick up and with the, the little bit of wind in the air this afternoon I don't think it's dangerous enough to split the race into the big echelons we normally see in Belgium life at the back of the peloton now impossible isn't it to get through that lot uh, so if you're not setting the pace at the front uh, you're not going to battle through a very tight bunch here the, the riders are not going to move out your way to let you through that's for sure and that's why that little group has got down that cycle path on the right and rapidly got up towards the front before it closes down again they're chaotic these roads in Belgium you see the little bit of cobblestone just over to the left and right hand side of the road that's actually parking space for their vehicles the, bi the bicycle tracks are over on the extreme left and right hand side yeah. and these guys will zigzag across that parking spot onto the cycle path to take any kind of risk that they can to get to the front end of the main field there's a problem at the back Yes, don't know what it is, either a flat tyre or a bit of a brake. No, it's going to require service anyway. Teammates waiting. A rear uh, flat tyre. Yep, that's uh, no panic at all here. This is Marco Marcato of, uh, well, it doesn't look like him to me. No, it isn't him, is it? A slight misread there because it it's looks like. Sebastian Rosler. Yeah, it's Rosler who's punctured, that's better. He's come over to the new Radio Shack team. He was on the Quick Step squad. Very good rider once he gets into his season and gets into his form. They've brought on some strong riders for these North of uh, Northern Europe classics. Segermans is a big sprinter for that squad, a formerly a lead-out man for Tom Bonin. Fell out with his team Katusha last year. He refused to sign the, the new contract, which... Uh, had some very severe penalty clauses in there which he disagreed with. Here is the town of Ronce or Rene where there was the famous world championship with uh, Steve Bauer and Claudie Criquillon coming to blows and uh, Mar Mar Maurizio Fondries got himself the victory. Back to the leaders, four minutes and 33 seconds. Yes and it was 12 and they have been out front since the 10th kilometre so they've been in the lead now for 132 kilometres as we head on to the Kreisberg now. This is quite a steep climb, this 13%, it's only 500 metres. This road is actually parallel to the road where the World Championship took place, which is over around about 200 metres away from here. There's a slight amount of cobbles as they get to the top part of this climb, and then they pop out onto the main road of the Kreisbergen. Rossler now safely back into the peloton. He won the fourth stage of the Tour of the Algarve back uh, just before this race began. So he's got good legs, but it's a lot warmer in the Algarve in Portugal at this time of the year. 4.31, 62k. Good tempo riding here now by Vishulin of Vacancelet. They're not showing any signs of... Oh, oh this is bad news. Uh, that is a shame as the gates have come down. Not sure where we are now. We're at the back of the race, I think we might be. We well, wouldn't have cut off just a couple. This could be the second group we've never seen. Well, I get a chance to see here. The uh, the barrier, the, the lights are just ah, actually coming on. They're actually on now. The police have allowed the peloton to come through, but I think they stopped the cars because they can't take the risk of the train appearing. And those guys were in the convoy coming back to the peloton. They've got stopped now. That's bad luck. It's very bad luck, and I don't think they'll be seeing this bike race anymore. We're uh, a little further up the climb here. It looks as if we're down to three men. Well, we've lost, in fact, we've lost one of the riders now, and it looks to me as though it's Kluger who's gone, the youngster on the squad. Yep, and this is uh, the chaos at the back. Uh, These guys uh, will oh never see Het Newsblad again uh, this year anyway. No, chance to have a chat with everybody else. They were unlucky because the police uh, saw the red lights come on. They know there's always a two or three minute uh, wait. So they've allowed the peloton through, stopped all the team cars, so there's going to be a race to get back to the peloton now, and those poor guys will find it pretty tough. Well, we've lost Klug and it's down to three men. These riders now are going to Look try to... Uh, road. <laughs> it's a long ah. way. They've probably lost themselves a, a good two and a half minutes, so I don't think they'll be seeing the main field again this afternoon. Poor the old Sam Bewley there for Team Radio Shack. He's a very good Australian, now getting his chance on a big team to come forward. Sam used to ride mountain bikes in Australia with some distinction as well. Almost at the top of the climb of the Kreisberg here. This is back onto the main road, and this is exactly the road where the World Championships finished when they had that little uh, spill between Bauer and Fondriest. Over the top of the climb, it's a very difficult, long, false flat, but you can see the main field here. They're starting to get a little bit more interested in getting themselves placed at the front end of the main field because they know this Kreisberg could cause a bit of a split at the back end of the peloton. Well, they know the pressure's on now, 61 kilometres to go. They've just got to keep riding hard at the front, those with ambition. 
Looks like Matthew Heyman in the black on the right of our picture there. And Dave Miller as well coming up to the front end of the yeah. main field. Uh, Miller, I think, uh, invigorated this year by these north of, north, of France, north of France and Belgium classics. But he's really today riding for the team captain, I would say, of Garmin Transitions. And that has got to be Tyler Farah. Yes, so Miller, you might have thought, would have been a man, a candidate for the Sky team. But the Sky are operating on a thorough no-drugs policy. And although they agree that Miller's a totally reformed man since he was caught taking EPO and lost his World Time Trial Championship, uh, they won't sign him. And that, that applies to anybody who's been remotely connected with drug scandals of the past. This is the new era, I think, in world cycling. And, uh, well, I can't complain about that. 3.41, coming down quickly. You can see the urgency now, Phil, because of the approach of this climb of the Kreisberg. The guys are getting a little bit nervous. This is Michael Barry on the front for Team Sky. He's trying to make sure that his men are up at the front end. There's a few hands coming off the handlebars as well. They're trying to make sure that these riders can be at the front end. I think we're getting a chance to have a look back at this. The police are actually encouraging there, Phil. They're, yeah, they're pretty much in control. They know the red light has just come on, but the fact is that the barriers haven't started to tumble, so the police have got the main bulk of the peloton through. Well, standing in the middle of the railroad track, by the policeman there's pretty confident the train's not coming anyway here we are down to three riders now the cracks are developing in the seams the one man they've dropped is a really good youngster for the future in Mike in Mike I had said nearly said Mike Kluger there Paul yeah. the former world cyclocross champion and I don't actually know do you think he's his son no not, no no Mike. relation no relation I don't think there must be lots of Klugers is it like Jones in it's Wales very much like Jones and hey. Evans and Davis <laughs> Savello right, well test right. team they're obviously thinking about Torhushoft and of course Henrik Hausler Hausler's uh, a great rider for this kind of you can see they're, they're taking this very seriously indeed now this ascent of the Krausberg they're trying to split off some of the men from the main field it looks like Fletcher actually sitting in second position it's a maximum 13% grade this but it's only 900 meters long Just that's a long. little bit deceptive though because it's 500 meters of cobblestones and it actually climbs up for a good kilometer once they've gone over the top of the cobblestone section well, the ride is slowly being chipped off the back here now under the pressure of Cervello in favour perhaps of Hausler or uh, Tor Hushoft. Hausler's coming back from injury and uh, had a terrific season last year. Will he get another crack at Milan San Remo? He's runner up to Mark Cavendish in that. Kluger, by the way, who's been dropped from the break now, just finished fourth in the Tour of Qatar. Uh, which is a, a spinter's race but a very hard race because of the strong crosswinds that blow over there in uh, Arabia I suppose they call it these days 3.13 the gap Bernie Eisel over on the left and Matty Breschel so there is a slight split and the, those guys are off the top end of the cobblestones while these men here at the back are still suffering so as they continue now at the back end of the race Kevin Holtzman's uh, shouldn't be in this position I suspect he's being dropped rather than coming back right now because he's falling away quite rapidly yeah, that's a surprise to see Holtzman's under pressure there. That's yeah. uh, uh, not a good sign for Team Quickstep for later on if they're going to try and do something for Tom Bonin. Or, of course, uh, Stein de Volder, the former Belgian national champion as well, because this is their race. This is the Frenchman uh, Sylvain Chavanel on Team Quickstep. He really has become a change rider since he moved across mm -hmm. from Team Cofidis to join Quickstep. And the reason for doing that was because he wanted to concentrate on the one-day classics. And the amazing thing is he actually took a cut in salary to come across to Quickstep to learn and ride with a classic team. Oh, feeling the heat of the day, that's for sure right now. There's a good little bit of action here. This might have caused a split in the peloton. Maybe it hasn't. As we pan down, it's quite a big bunch, this. Three minutes more or less now. 38 miles left to ride. And that's a long, thin line. So the pressure's on. I think the boys at the back will be under pressure. They haven't had managed to get the hours in in January and February. We're moving to the end of the month now. Upcoming shortly will be the early classic races, one days. Wow, look at that. Yeah, wonderful cycling country here around Ronsa. You can uh, zigzag across this chain of hills all the way from here to Merbeck. And it's along this chain of hills that most of the big races in Belgium are actually based. There are not a lot of mountainous areas to go to, but the, what the organisers do here is they zigzag any which way they can. There's Herrick Stegemans moving to the front there and uh, the red helmet there of Team Radio Shack. He could be a, a big surprise if this race comes down to a big bunch sprint down towards the end. Well, the thing here with Stegemans is he's on quick step last year and uh, he only won two races and by this time last year he'd already had his second win so he, it wasn't a great season for him in the end with one or two problems as well, crashes and stuff. So 
Radio Shack have got faith in him. Uh, of course, he was getting as quick as Tom Bonin, so he couldn't stay on the same team as Tom Bonin. So I guess Radio Shack are thinking he could be our man. He was not uh, terribly impressive in the tour down under, where they tried to get him through for the wins. Didn't happen. Let's see how he goes here, though. He's in the right position right now. Philippe Gilbert at the front there for Lotto Pharma. He's a man who'll be looking to get a victory. He's a, he's a French-speaking Belgium, and he, he loves Liège, Baston Liège, but he has shown over the past uh, couple of years that he can ride well in events like the Tour of Flanders, and, of course, he's a previous winner of Het Volk. A little bit of a tight bend, this one. Some take into the cross-country on the course. Just leaving room for the motorbike to get through as he slips out of the peloton. Looking a bit raggedy at the back end of the main field. That's an indication that the pressure is starting to get lifted at the front end of the pack as these riders now start to think about how to split up the main field, how to get rid of the sprinters and how to force a small breakaway off the front end. The race has changed uh, over the last couple of seasons. It used to finish uh, habitually up in Lokeren, about 25 kilometres to the north of Ghent and they took in a lot of cobble roads towards the last uh, 25 kilometres but now the running towards the finish line in Ghent makes it a little bit more difficult to split up the main field. A little bit of a shake, rattle and roll now for 800 metres at Donderai. The three leaders, the three musketeers, they've been out, let me just quickly tell you, uh, 68 kilometres, they've been out 200, no, 140. Oh, 140 more or less, yeah, 136 kilometres in the lead today. That's a long way at this time of the year, they've done pretty well. They must have put some miles in to survive this far in front of a peloton. Was 12 minutes, forcibly reduced at a railroad crossing. Mind you, in uh, people like Guédon, uh, Curvers and Verschillen are not uh, so well known at the top of the peloton, but gaydon has been a, around a long time. 2.56 now. Soon it'll be over. This will be the longest race that most of these riders have participated in so far this season. Most of the early season uh, training races or preparation races uh, cap out between 160 and 180 kilometres in length, and this is one of the first times these riders will have taken their bodies over the 200 kilometre mark. And having been in a long breakaway like this in these cold weather conditions, it'll start to eat into the energy levels that these riders have got. And uh, I would expect to see them getting pulled in fairly shortly. You can actually almost visibly see the distant difference in the speed between the main field and the three riders we were just looking at. Still the dust of Belgium here. As we look at the rear of the peloton, and we've got uh, a long, long bunch just uh, gradually reforming here, but now it looks as though Cervelo has started to keep the pressure on here. As they continue to do this, just looking down, we've got uh, the peloton now really getting down to some graft here. 2.49 and ticking off. Another railroad crossing safely negotiated. Peloton is still pretty big, full length of cars, one or two riders in the convoy at the moment, trying to repair the damage from flat tyres, there's plenty of those in Belgium at this time of the year, that's for sure. Yeah, but it's a lot more uh, organised at the front end of the peloton now, the fact that the main field is stretching out into that big long line is an indication that the serious part of this bike race is about to unfold. A lot of riders from Radio Shack at the front there in the red. It'll be interesting to see how BMC perform as well because they'll be looking to see whether or not they can garner themselves a, a slot in the Tour de France with George Hincapie and, of course, Cadell Evans. Radio Shack clatters onto the cobbles at Donderai now. 2.40 the gap here. Lots of guys willing to work now. This is this Philippe Gilbert? No, yes, it is Philippe Gilbert at the front. Yep, you can see the, the, the anguish on the riders' faces now as they realise this is a good place to try and uh, crack the field. It's a very smooth section of cobblestones, this one here at Donderai. No, I don't think it's uh, rough enough to split the peloton, but it could create a little bit of uh, devastation at the back. That's Matty Breschel up there in fourth place. Yep. He's actually starting to look rather good and solid this year. He's in a different coloured jersey to everybody else because he's the Danish national champion on Saxo Bank. No shortage of work rate from Philippe Gilbert, a Belgian who loves these classic races. He's not a Belgian from the area either, comes down from the Ardennes. He look forward to all of the classics. He's won this race twice and he's won it on his own too. But he, he, whenever he gets into a move, it's through sheer hard work. There's no lucky move for Philippe. And the, there he is setting the pace, wondering why nobody's helping him. Well, the reason is because they haven't actually caused too much damage at the back end of the pack. Yes, one or two weaker members of the main field, but it's not, I don't really think, hard enough, this section of cobblestones. It's a very smooth section of cobblestones, but obviously one or two riders disagree with me. Yeah, is he hanging on or is he going off? 
223 the gap a little bit of a concertina at the front again now all looking for somebody else to make the move Gilbert Rabobank looking for a move there as well in the orange jerseys coming together now when it comes like that it doesn't look to be a very big peloton anymore oh there's the rest well, yeah, well, on. every now and again every acceleration that we go over over the next couple of kilometers there'll be uh, five or six riders will get shed off the back this is Kevin Ister of Coffee Dis uh, Le Credit en Ligne and as you can see he's uh, having a hard time just staying on the back end of the line of the riders in front of him that acceleration on the cobblestones did cause a bit of damage but not that much yet Kevin Ister, just a one win for him last year and it came at this time of the year down in the Tour of the Mediterranean, the third stage was last year's victory for him but he also was the runner-up in this event last year so he had the form then and he knows all about now have we got a crash or a little blockage somebody stopped right in the middle of the road to put his chain back on yep. yes and it's uh, it was Matty like, Goss is it Matty Goss? Yep. yes Matty it is Goss. It's funny how they always use his middle name. He must sign in as Matty Harley got. With a name like Harley, he must go well. <laughs> yeah, well, he's pretty laid back at the moment, trying to get himself back into the main field. Heinrich Hausler over on the left in the black jersey. This is the an owner a chaos at the back as well. This is uh, Katusha were having a few difficulties. Now, that was not a good place to have it. Gilbert still riding pretty close to the front end of the main field. Tomoka Boonen coming up there on the right, a Belgian national champion, and Juan Antonio Fletcher of Team Sky stuck in the middle. New colours, by the way, for Goss moving across from Saxo Bank over the winter period. Bit of a loss for Saxo Bank, I think, but the Aussie happy to join the American setup. He's a Tasmanian. We've got one or two good riders coming out of Tasmania. It's only a s small uh, addendum to the main island of Australia, but nonetheless, it's a great uh, terrain and very typical uh, northern hemisphere weather, really, even though it's very much in the southern hemisphere. And it looks as though. Goss is going to have to cut his way through this. He had the form this time last year, finished third in Ghent Wavelgum, still to come, which has a new date slot Stein at the end Volder. of March. And Stein de Volde also struggling. No, he shouldn't. Maybe you know, he was stopped. He's got a. He has a. He's had a very hard time since the the, the epic seasons he had a couple of years ago. Uh, he's had a hard time ha actually holding on to his form for the full length of a season. And certainly a man like him, former Belgian champion, former winner of the uh, Tour of Flanders, shouldn't be going off the back at 54 kilometres to go. Guy at the back is Guillaume Blot, just uh, sitting at the back of the group. Ah, there's the answer. It's Team Rabobank who's decided for some reason to send all the men to the front. And just see the white jersey and red shorts there of Ivanov. He's never far away from the front, watching everything that comes at him. Now, his typical move will be attack, if he could, on the Mur de Grammont. Well, uh, obviously, this is a, a predestined move here by Rabobank because it actually has caused a split in the main field. You notice how t uh, Tom Bonin is also very attentive. Yep. Never far from the front is Heinrich Hausler. And, ooh, the nasty little piece of road there. Meanwhile, back with the leaders, gently coming off that piece of road onto the concrete slabs at two minutes just. Heading on to the Tyenberg now. This is a well-known climb in all of these one-day classic races. The boys know it well. The Tyenberg is about as steep as the Koppenberg. It's a very short climb, but at the start of the season, these guys are going to have a very difficult time getting up this bike race, up this climb. You can see they're trying to use the gutter down towards the side. At this time of the year, those cobblestones are very, very slimy and, and greasy. And uh, if you just start to lose out a little bit, oh. here's Roger Kluge about to get caught first time he's had company for about 20 kilometers a lot more than that uh, yes if we count the leaders that's right this is Nick, oh, Noyens. Nick Noyens here in trouble that's a shame two-time winner this race it's a Lange one-time winner rather he's had a second place oh he's not very happy is yeah he? well Langevelt there number 62 is trying to help him get that back wheel in but that was a very slow change and you see the reason that uh, there was no team cars behind is that a lot of riders have been dropped and the yeah. team cars by the referees have been held behind those drop riders so that's why those two riders had to service each other that'll be a tough one now for Nick um, it'll be even tougher here. Oh dear! Oh, that's a long wait, oh, and that's Lentz, you're saying. Well, that's what. Uh, well, I think they're wrong, actually. Good lad. I'm a light conference. <laughs> well done. Yes, back to the leaders. Three of them still coming up on the smooth channel there of the towards the top of the Tyneberg, and it is uh, Guedon who once surprised everybody when Ooh. he won Paris Roubaix, and when we were getting over that, he nipped out and he won Paris Tour. A few well, years was, apart. Just a couple of years ago, he was 36 years of age when he won Paris yeah. Tours, and that was a big surprise victory. In fact, he used all of his tactical knowledge of a seasoned professional to outwit the guy that he was with to come up to the finish line. 
glorious day in Tour it was that day. Beautiful end of summer day. Oof, that was a bit <laughs> risky going through. I think that's mud on the corner, isn't it? It certainly is. Oh. A lot of riders are prepared to take the risk going around there just to try and move up for two or three places now. Tom Boonen coming up to the front. That's a good reason to try and take note because this is a big, typical, heavy, strong move by Tom Boonen. Look at this now. He's, He's decided he needs somebody to come and join him here as he goes clear on the Tyenberg. This is Bonin at his best. He loves cobbled climbs. He loves these short, explosive efforts on these races in Belgium. And he was with uh, Kinziato there from Liquigas. Briefly. But, but only <laughs> briefly. Tom has got a great amount of support here in Belgium. And I think he's yep. got his head back together again. You know, it's very difficult being a star in Belgium because the pressure is on your shoulders all of the time. And I think that's uh, what led to to Tom's uh, excursions away from the, the fine line of looking after himself. But now everyone seems to think that Tom Bonin is back and uh, this is an indication that his form is good at the early part of the season. Well, it is good because don't forget he finished third in the Tour de Qatar. I think he's won that in the past. He got a couple of stage wins with his sprint. He also won the new race uh, stage of the Tour of Oman. So he's got the form and now is the chance to show his home market here because... You're, if you're a cyclist at this level of Bonin in Belgium, then you are an A-class celebrity because this is their number one sport. No, he certainly is. A, he looks great in that world, in that Belgian national champs jersey. Let's not forget a former world champion as well. Goes round that corner as if it was a flat piece of road. He was hoping, I think, Phil, to splinter a small group off the front, but mm. nobody could actually follow his acceleration. And look what sort of a gap he's got in 500 metres. Well, it was a bit vicious, let's face it. Now he's going to see what damage there is. He's not trying to solo all the way 51 kilometres up to the break and win the race, that's for sure. But has he managed to cause a few cracks in the peloton that might develop into, say, 20, 30 riders going forward only, which would be much more manageable? If you can do that on the Mur de Gramont next time through, that'll be a, a welcome attack. Now, reforming at the front, but behind Bonin. Yeah, everybody's looking around. OK, who's, who's going to do the pacemaking now? But at uh, the moment, they realise they're still looking at a good 51 kilometres to go to the finish. They don't think that yet is quite the tactical point. Of course, Philippe Gilbert does. He'll go for any kind of move if he can get a, a, an acceleration off the front. He is an attentive bike rider. That's Gilbert in second position there with his teammate up alongside him. And they actually have got a slight gap. I think Fletcher's in there as well. Well, this is a, this might be the split that Tom has been tempting away because they've got it going here, and the Omega boys are willing to uh, to help this attack. Look at the daylight forming behind. And note the distance: exactly 50 kilometres to go. I presume uh, Bowen is still away around that corner, and that is a very much a little group which he would love to see. Yeah, well, this is a nice move. Two, three riders in there from Rabobank. You saw they were very attentive a little earlier. Look at these roads. These are very technical roads. There's Tom Bonin just around the corner. Yes, and I wonder if he knows the damage he's done, exactly what he planned to do here. The colours of the champion of Belgium flying away. 1.30 the gap. Very soon the trio in front will be spotted. Desperate moments here from about 13 riders, led by the new name, always changing the name, the Lotto team. It's Omega Pharmacy right now. And I think that's Leif Hoster up there with him, you know. Or it's either him or... or oh, I tell you who it is, it's Jürgen Rollins setting the pace. That's right, it is Jürgen Rollins. But you know what, the main field are clawing their way back. They haven't actually uh, formed that group off the front end. Everybody was attentive and they're hoping to make the junction with that man there, the champion of Belgium, Tom mm -hmm. Bonin. The gap to the three leaders now, just a minute and a half as we start to get to the more tactical point of this race. It's a good move by Bonin and it might be shaping the chase here. It certainly had an effect on that leading trio. We're still at 50 kilometers to go, I think. We, oh, there we are. Thought we'd stuck for a moment. 49 now, uh, well, but still the big climbs to come. Well, Bonin, you see, he's quite happy to just keep the tempo, to keep that little gap, hoping that the small group is going to come up to him and be the first a decisive move in this year's Het Newsblad race. I think it all is well for Tom's early season campaign. This is a strong move by a man who's finding his form. He's had a good stretch in Qatar, and he'll be looking to do well in the Tour de Flanders. And, of course, in paris Bay, all the races he's done well in before. But he knows that's where he gets the headlines. That's where he gets the big slices of publicity here in Belgium. And he's well, such he's not, a strong man, isn't he? He's I mean, not looking around at all no, here. He he's not looking for, uh, for any respite. He's just keeping the pressure on tempting the other riders to come up to him that just was just to prove you wrong now. i know i knew yeah, he was it's always doing that. the way little check that was all 
but he is not hanging around he's actually putting a serious amount of effort into this to see whether or not he can splinter the front end of the main field well again although it was down to about 10 or 12 they're going through the small town of Etikov and there's another cobble climb not too far away from here that group now around about 30 riders strong now when there are no psychopaths you're allowed to ride on the road in Belgium but if there are psychopaths you are not allowed to ride on the road at all in Belgium it's quite a hefty fine if the police car comes along so you must always use the cycle paths here unless you're in the het newsblad of course then you can do what you like that's a that's a not a bad group though paul what is it 25 30 riders only so i think that first attack by bonan has done the damage there's the second split now if they can push home the attack on the next little cobble climb it's not even the full pellet on that is it no, that climb uh, really did split the main field and everyone now scrambling to pull themselves back into the peloton all it needs is that group at the front there to get themselves organized. You only need four or five guys to be organized to then start to consolidate on that gap. Meanwhile, back at the front, still doing what professionals do best, labor at a minute and eight seconds lead for these three riders. 30 miles left to go to the finish. We're up to a climb which will take us 120 meters above sea level. This is the Eichenberg, it's a, a tough climb, there's a little bit of tarmac over to the left hand side for the riders and they're taking that to get some respite but again it's the kind of climb that Bonin I think will put another acceleration on to see whether or not he can just damn those riders behind to obscurity. Well if I was Frederick Gedon and the age of 38 plus I think I'd be pretty pleased with the way I'm riding today. This man is really having a terrific race, doing a lot of work in that breakaway Tom Bonin just appears to be riding along but in fact he's holding off a very elite chase bunch just at the minute and he's going to keep the pressure on on the Eichenberg because he wants them to come to him he doesn't want to go to them again a very hard climb it's 10 percent at the bottom but once you go over the crest you've got about a, a kilometer of false flat and that's where the damage is done on a climb like the Eichenberg Bonin will keep the pressure and the tempo high here tempting the group to come back up to him because he knows guys like Philippe Gilbert will see him as the rabbit that they're going to try and chase down well oh, he's got himself into the rough there and uh, not really the best place because it's quite muddy there you know and you get back wheel spin and it uh, upsets your climbing rhythm this they're saying is the third group so that's the second bunch chasing Tom and there's about to be a coming together here oh dear me there's a lot of riders coming back yeah, it seems as if that front group of contenders there are not too keen to really put the hammer down it was only Omega Farmer Lotto with uh, Philippe Gilbert yeah. trying to keep the pressure up I think everybody else was actually quite happy to be passengers in the group and the pressure's on the front again four riders clear now little gap that just opening up so it might be another split here there's Tomica just waiting. Now he's taking a look. See, they're coming up towards him. He's getting ready for another move, Tom. But he wants some legs to come and help him out. He looks pretty lean over the last couple of seasons. He'd uh, aired towards the chubby side, but this I think looks like a man who's really prepared his season this year. He's obviously dreaming about the Ronde van Vlaanderen, which is uh, on very similar roads to this in about a month's time. But he's also, of course, dreaming of Paris Roubaix as well. That looks like Gilbert trying to come across the gap. Now that would make a solid duo. Flag of Belgium on his back here as the national champion. He's won over 100 races since he turned pro back in 2002. He is a born winner, a very strong bike rider, and showing it today, I think. And looking as though he's got good early season form. I wonder where he went training. Well, uh, maybe the United Arab Emirates for about a month. That helped. And that would help, and that was good weather 35 degrees Celsius. and. Uh, a lot of flat racing, I would have to say, for the riders there. Very much decided by the uh, sprints. Bonin looking over his shoulder. This is the hardest part of the Eichenberg, I've always thought, because this is the part where you've, you've really pushed yourself on the steep part, the 10% gradient at the bottom. Then all of a sudden, this false, false flat carries on for another kilometre. Lars, go for it. Well, we'll see. That must be Lars back, the support there. Or Lars, boom. Uh, or Lars away from that's him. probably more likely Lars Boom, he think. is yes. very popular in this part of the world in fact uh, the uh, cyclocross discipline of the sport is extremely popular in Belgium and Holland and I was talking to one of the Belgian journalists uh, just before the start and he said to me we're now starting to see hooliganism come into cyclocross which is rather unfortunate because it's something we don't normally get in cycling maybe because it's cold and they drink a lot yeah well they need to in Belgium but uh, it's a very very popular sport especially also in uh, Slovakia Czech Republic, big sport. 
and that everybody pays to watch which means that the riders get well paid to participate at least the big names do and Philippe Gilbert has got himself up in this little group now reassessment but Gilbert is a cunning bike rider he was the first up to reach Tom Bone and keep an eye on his house as well is it yes it is this is a good looking group now now this is a group which has uh, got some good names in the kind of group that could work extremely well together but they haven't got that big a gap over the front end of the main field yet no, but the top top names here, Tom Bonham will have assessed the strength of the riders joining him, at least in reputation, and uh, decide whether it's worth to keep the pace up. There's a little group of about 15, 20 riders here. Radio Shack been caught out, BMC caught out. They're going to have to get themselves organised at the front end there to try and pull it back. There's even offer uh, sitting at the back end Ooh. of that group in the white jersey. Don't look too pleasant, this stretch of cobblestones, as they came off that bend, but it's smoothed out pretty quickly. We should be seeing the leaders very shortly now, inside a minute, on these Flanders flat farm fields here. There's the S bend, lovely, lovely racing, and with the constant changing of direction of wind as well, it makes hard racing. But looking at the leafless trees, they're also a bit lifeless, so I'm not sure there isn't any wind today. It's definitely not springtime yet in Belgium and the Flanders. Uh, this is very much uh, the, the end of winter, very cold at the start this morning, just uh, tickling uh, three, four degrees Celsius. This group uh, is a good, solid group, good riders in it, but they haven't yet broken the stranglehold of the main field. Hausler thinks this is an opportunity. He comes to the front, immediately relayed there by Tom Bonin. Bonin's still happy to push on here. He's obviously feeling frisky. I'm not sure he's riding like a future winner of this event, though, the way he's switching around and making such an effort, but he's got himself a very elite split, if they can keep it up. Here are the three leaders, now 58 seconds clear. And for a change, it looks as though Gedon slipped to number three wheel. This is the Wolvenberg, uh, a small climb, but it's very steep at 17.3%. Horrible little climbs, to be quite honest, these. You've got to really work on them, but they are a cyclist's paradise. Well, the Kopf van der Weegs ride, the front end of the bike race, still these three riders who've been away since the 10th kilometre of the race, uh, Gedon over on the left-hand side, uh, Two great classic victories to his credit, Paris Roubaix and of course Paris Tours. And uh, Corvus struggling a little bit at the back there for Team Skill Shimano. He's just trying to keep that big body of his going up once they go over the top of this climb. It's a short climb at around about 700 meters, but when you've been in uh, when you've been in the saddle for uh, 150 kilometers, it starts to hurt quite a bit. Well, I think those three guys are still riding pretty well considering how long they've been out front and the time of the year. But it's down to 55 seconds, cost them a couple of seconds on the climb. This little group still working away with Gilbert now stepping on the gas. Hausler anxious to test his knee. You see he's got the old strip bandage on the knee there. Hold it back in position. As somebody coming across there from Rabobank and from HTC. Well, Hausler's got a fine pair of legs. Yes, he is. Struggling to get back from that knee injury that's uh, dogged him since the end of the last season. And uh, you can see that's a great shot looking at how, how is, far back and what kind of damage has been done I'm by this small climb. I was thinking the same myself when you said it. It was a lovely shot, that. Make a nice jigsaw puzzle. But uh, I think it's more a test day for Heinrich here. Anxious to see uh, where he exactly is with his form and his injury. Giving his knee a good test. And uh, the other boy is not allowing him out of their sight. In fact, uh, this group is reforming. Well, it's a scramble more than anything else to, to try and uh, consolidate that leading group. But it is uh, having a serious effect on the riders at the back. The weaker elements in this main field now are starting to wonder which is the shortcut back to Ghent. The, you can see the, the Vlaams Alu, the Lion of Flanders flags there over on the right-hand side. There is a little bit of a tailwind on this climb. The race starting and finishing in Ghent, but for some reason we hardly ever use its real title, which is Ghent-Ghent. Always the sponsor gets the... Uh, prime position was Het Volk now it's uh, Het Nieuwsblad who bought Het Volk that's the way to get your sponsorship sorted 43 kilometers to go still plenty of time slightly less than one hour of racing I would suspect at the moment and uh, again former champion of Belgium pushing on yeah Jürgen Rolands again this is a long section of cobblestones here it's a 2.4 kilometers in length coming straight across the gap there Heinrich Hausler so close to winning uh, Milan San Remo last year when he came in second to Mark Cavendish. He had a great season after that, he won himself a stage in the Tour de France, and now he's looking to try and get himself uh, written onto the history books of uh, Het Newsblad. 
the amazing thing is for when you talk to most of the Belgians they still call this race Het Volk they can't get that long history <laughs> of the, the name no. the race Het Volk out of their minds it's a very interesting bike race uh, the best British performance by the way was by Graham Jones Paul that was quite a while I think you were racing then, I was you? Graham Jones was Good. second on that occasion he behind uh, uh, behind Josef Briet and I was eighth in the bunch sprint good heavens there above go. uh, long time ago things then. have happened that was back in 1982 Gosh, I didn't remember that. I can't remember that far back myself anymore. But anyway, it's true. Funnily enough, there's only six nations ever won this race. So, so I'm going to give you them all now. Uh, Norway, Belgium, Italy, Germany, Netherlands and Ireland. And of course, Ireland it was not Sean Kelly. It was the great Shea Elliott who sadly died uh, some time ago now. But he won back in 1959. And that was the first time this race was ever won by a foreign cyclist other than Belgium. No, this is Belgium's race. They've always dominated here, although in the, the 1970s and 80s, it was very much dominated by the Dutch and uh, Jan Raas and uh, the rally squad used to come down here and trounce the Belgians on home soil. Now, we sent you that white picture just to prove these are live pictures coming in from Belgium and uh, occasionally the signal gets interrupted, but nonetheless, this has been a tough race this last 10, 15 kilometres. Everybody at the front in this group now have really had to work very hard to be here. There's still one or two living in hope just behind. Well, this is Lars Boom. You can see the red, white and blue on his, sh on his shoulders there. He saw the sign. There. He must have seen the sign. Yeah. This guy has been, since uh, the junior level, for the last 10 years, he has been the, the Dutch national champion in cyclocross. He's been world champion as well and he's uh, a star for the future he's only 24 years of age and I think he's uh, finally decided to come and have a serious taste on the road no, absolutely brilliant at cyclocross he became the world junior champion he then went on to be the world under 23 champion then the world champion he's done it all in cyclocross maybe he got bored and that's why he's trying his luck but he is riding very well he got four wins on the road last year including the Tour of Belgium where he won overall, but he didn't win a stage. And you can also throw in a world time trial championship as well at the under-23 level of the sport. Uh, definitely bad. a man to look forward to. Uh, a couple of years ago, he had 15 wins on the road when he rode for the Rabobank Continental Squad. Amazing thing about Rabobank, they invest a lot of money in all levels of the sport of cycling in Holland, from uh, men's and women's racing to mountain bike racing, track racing, cyclocross. They really do support the sport in their country. Oh, the, the feedy man had to stand on the road and pass it to his rider on the footpath there. And so they switched back again now. It's a serious, a serious move this yeah. by Lars Boom. He's uh, not holding anything back at all. He can't be too far away from seeing that leading group of three riders. And he's uh, basically provoking the riders in that group to maybe come forward and see whether or not they can actually uh, split the group. Well, they'll treat Lars Boom with... a serious intent here though he's not been at the top of road cycling for very long they do know his ability so they're going to keep on holding him in their sights if they can 41 to go no longer a time check on the leaders and Mathieu is where we are more cobbled roads aren't they wonderful living in Belgium with these cobbled roads so easy to keep up as well well, this pressure by, first of all, Tom Boone and now followed up by Lars Boom is actually having a f an effect of consolidating a leading group of around about 20 riders now. And if they keep the pressure on like this, this could be a deciding point in this race. The road's a little bit smoother now, so the old teeth can stop chattering just for the moment. Things drop off your bike on those cobblestones you didn't even know you had on it. But roads of Belgium and uh, northern France can destroy any kind of machinery, and it's a good test bed for a lot of the... Uh, Com companies to come and try out new equipment and I would expect a little later on in the year Lance Armstrong will be racing on these roads because the Tour de France uh, starting in Rotterdam this year will curse its way across Holland and across yep. northern France taking in some cobblestone sections so it'll be good uh, we are hearing in fact that Lance Armstrong will be riding the Tour of Flanders he has ridden in the past and uh, the reason for riding that is to test out his equipment that he'll be using during the month of July in the Tour de France when it goes across the cobblestones of the north of France. Yes, very typical preparation by Armstrong. Age is no barrier, as he proved last year when he got third in the Tour. There seems to be an inordinate number of motorbikes on this race. They're all over the place. Ah, look at this now. He's gone to the front now. He got even off. Russian national champion looking over his shoulders is seeing whether or not to, he always seems to have the knack to catch these riders at the moment when they're li looking to, to have a little bit of respite and that's the yep. ideal time to attack and he's pulled away a group of seven 
That's going to cause a reaction, and it has, as a group of four try to cross very quickly. Looks like Quick Step leading the charge. Well, it looks like another Katusha rider actually is leading the charge. That's a good move. His own teammate chasing him down. And it looked like Stegmans was in there as well, there for Team Radio Shack. They want to get themselves a little bit of success if they can, Radio Shack. They built a team now not just for the Tour de France they built a team that is capable of racing in the one-day classics still clear 46 seconds now they're really making a meal of it and that uh, looked like Gilbert, Gilbert was it yep. yes that was Philippe Gilbert I don't know what happened there number 41 was it a bike change or a wheel change camera cut him back rather quickly well he's up and running but he's in a group a little bit further back he was That's in that shame. leading group of contenders chasing the, the three-man breakaway well, I get a oh, chance get a to see chance. what happened Did he here. fall off or did he puncture? I reckon he might have fallen off. Oh, he, oh, he crashed did fall on the right-hand yes. side. Well, I don't know how that happened at all. No. He was going in a straight line. It must have, again, it must have just been one of those little div divisions in the road in Belgium. The Belgian roads, uh, especially the ones made out of uh, cement, can be ah. very, very precarious. He got up quite quickly, didn't he? He did. So he actually got back into the group he was with. No, this is the, this is the group behind. Oh, that's the group behind. 44 seconds now to the leading group of three. 39 kilometres to go. Lars Boom still hovering off the front end of the main field. Well, he knows the coming, that's for sure. And has he done any damage? And the answer is not too much. He might have tired a few people out, but they're still all riding behind him. And uh, Ivanov's been joined by everybody else in that leading group. You see, in the early part of the season, a lot of these riders are on pretty much the same level of fitness. They haven't managed to get into the area of the season when they have these peaks and troughs. Everybody's uh, on the same level with the same amount of training in their legs. Another time for an attack here now. Quick step launching a move. Just starting to stretch the legs again. If they keep on this pressure, it's got to give sooner or later. 43 seconds, inside 40 kilometres to the finish. Just looking down that line of riders. In fact, this uh, group is starting to swell once again. It was down to just about 20 men. Santa Maria Horbeck. These are all these little towns. They're all uh, not too far away from Brakel, which uh, to me always seems to be the centre of Belgian racing. It happens to be the home of Peter van Pietigem and, of course, of uh, Robbie McEwen. Rossler still at the front. They've uh, worked very hard, the pair from Omega, uh, with Gilbert. But Gilbert, I'm not sure where he is now. He might be at the back of this group. Well, oh, be, what's happened here? There's a problem for uh, Rabo Bank over on the right. A little bit of a problem with the camera <laughs> in the middle too. I think our cameraman just took to the local lake. He's Postuma. Postuma. Yeah, he had, he has got a mechanical problem there. He was trying to fix it himself, but then he's got his hand in the air. Well, 38 kilometres to go, 23 seconds on the next long open stretch of road. The main field will finally see these three riders for the first time since the 10th kilometre of the race. 166 kilometres in the lead now. That's just over 100 miles they've headed up this race today. It's slowly but surely coming to an end. HTC Columbia on the move. It's not Matthew Harley Goss, that's for sure. Well, this is actually that small group of riders is still f starting to consolidate at the front end of the main field. A little uh, push to talk button back to the team car. Okay, what's happening? How far be behind are you? Is the groups going to come all back together? Yes, I don't think it's uh, TJ Van. I'm not sure it's not Martin Bell. It's actually one of the twins. Well, there's a long longiline shape of Martin Velitz there. Yeah. You can see that nobody wants to chase him right now. I think everybody's starting to feel the hammer coming down on them, and they know there's still uh, a couple more climbs, a couple more precarious climbs a little bit further up the road. That's just so you can see his handlebars are the same width as his chest, and they are, so he's got the right bike today. 20 seconds is the gap, but they're bringing it back now. It's all going to happen before we get to the climb of the Mur de Gramont, or the Mur de Gerardsbergen, which is... Uh, the town rather than the region 20 seconds the gap holding three six oh and the rest all back together but it's, it's getting smaller every time they repair the damage some riders don't come back with them and every now and again the three or four riders scrambling across the gap taking uh, the opportunity to jump away from a group uh, further back down the road to try and stay in contention for this race het news blad there is uh, the, the lone man from HTC Columbia trying to get himself off the front end of the main field, but he's still looking to make the junction with the three leaders at 20 seconds. Good tempo riding causing the split. 
as they continue to push on here. We're now going to find out exactly who it is. It's it. Well, it's uh, Marcel Steberg. Steberg. Can't say I've seen him on the attack before. Anyway, he's he's on the attack right now and tempting everybody else to come out. We must not forget that HTC Columbia have only been in being two and a half years and they've been the world's number one team throughout that time. They seem to be able to win with every rider on their squad. This is the Molenberg, 14.2% and there's Ooh. a nice little move coming here by Curvers from Skill Shimano. Yes. And look how slippery it is. Well, it's a bit greasy in the woods. Down in the woods today as uh, Gedon grits his teeth and drags himself back across the gap here. The maturing Frenchman great competitor and there's the race for the corner everybody slams on sandwiches around the boys on the inside just about still moving the guys at the back get on and who uh, likes a cobble climb there we go and look how slimy it is we've had a bit of rain here while the race has been held and now Tom Bonin is driving but he's got a few rivals with him now uh, there's not many people could rival Tom Bonin though when it comes to a short cobble climb like this uh, the Molenberg he re he's very dominant on these uh, short, aggressive, s steep climbs, just like Johan Museo used to be. Now, is he going to hurt people? He's softening them up for the climb of the Muir, that's for sure now. The rain is off, and this is the Steberg who's about to be picked up by Tom. He might just get to the top. Yes, he has more or less made the top, so that's a good sign because... He's in the right position now as the group comes up. But what's interesting is that group of three have actually extended their advantage uh, back up to 30 seconds. Uh, when you think that uh, men like Bonin and Philippe Gilbert are chasing behind, that's a bit of a surprise. Caught out there by the acceleration is Heinrich Hausler. He's trying to get himself across the gap. Well, all of a sudden, there's a big peloton dancing their way through the public down there. Interesting. Well, they all made the junction just at the bottom of the climb. Where while we go back to the three leaders, Curvert made a very nice move there. Kop van der Weegstrijd, the top end of the bike race. Gedon closing the sandwich in at the back end there. But just looking a little bit further down the road there, you can start to see the front end of this race. Marcel Seberg may have started something here that might develop as Tom Bonin has used the springboard of the Molenberg, bringing with him uh, four more riders. They're a tenacious lot today, I have to say, because they've all got them in their gun sights again. Another move going off the front. Bonin has been very attentive, and he's tried on a number of occasions to break the strangle hull, but he just doesn't seem to have been able to quite crack it. Hausler well, there. Yeah, now is that, uh, is that Curvers coming back into the group there, being passed? I think it is. He can't, he's got some good legs if it is, after 200k, but... Uh, Still splitting up here. 18 seconds. There they are. I thought there was a traffic jam over to the it right hand side. It looked like it, yes. I think we go the other way. Yeah. This is a tough I hope we you go can see, the other way. You can see the flags there. They've got a slight crosswind here, which is why all the riders are scuttling down the left hand side of the road, and it's a very precarious. If they put the hammer down now, if they get themselves organised, they could create a good cap. Well, Bonin's ridden a good race today. He's tried a couple of moves. They haven't worked. He's hurt a lot of people, maybe even himself. Hausler's paying attention, always in the mix as well. So too uh, uh, Jürgen Rolands. Bit of a surprise winner in the Belgian Championship a couple of years ago, but nonetheless proving his worth now. No, it wasn't Curvis, because there he is on the front. Still three. Yes, but a mere 15 seconds. Look how boggy ah, the fields are. Keep your heads down, are. boys. Look how boggy the fields are in the Flanders this afternoon. Uh, Great bike, but great, great backdrop there as the riders have the, the mole and behind them the windmill. It'll never take off at that speed. As we're now looking here at the capture of Seaberg and another little attack coming. Jurgen Rollins again digging. Marcus Berghardt. Matty Breschel in third Breschel place there. In third place, sorry, yeah. Coming up there. And uh, these guys, this is a good move here that Ooh, can, because Bonin there. and Philippe Gilbert are watching each other and this could be the moment when they may well just uh, with a little bit of inattention allow a small group to go off the front but that group once again has swelled it it's swelling up and being reduced in numbers it's swelling up and coming back down again in numbers very much like a refinery distilling all the best quality oil to the top right okay do they distill oil I'm not sure well, it's a still. Well, fine oil, though. Yeah, yes, but it's what well, the still is the process. Oh, is it? Because it separates the different layer of hydrocarbons. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. Tune into World Cycling Productions and learn about oil. That's great. Huh? 
Right, now this is, we don't know in fact if Philippe Gilbert got back, do we? I would suggest that he probably did because that was a very large group that he was involved in and I think he may well have just been able to do it on the Molenberg. And this is his teammate, Jürgen Rowlands, former champion of Belgium, digging in and uh, not getting the same attraction as if it had been Tom Bonin attacking. He's the current Belgian champion. Here we go, and there's the Rowlands around the corner. He can see his quarry. 34 kilometres from the end, they broke away 10 kilometres into the race. It's been a very good breakaway. The, uh, you know, I haven't seen one of these guys take a turn out. They've been really good together. They've, every one of them has put his back into the success of this breakaway, which is why they've still managed to survive, having been away since the 10th kilometre. And again, we're still looking at HTC Columbia, mm. keeping the hammer on, putting a bit of pressure now onto Team Sky. Now, you might think that is Martin Vellis, but in fact, it's Seberg again. Well done. Good okay. spot. OK. 24 seconds to the peloton, but it looks as though Jürgen Rowlands might be the far apart, getting up to that breakaway first. And it looks like Fletcher coming across the gap now. The big boys are now starting to be that little bit more attentive at the front end of the main field, but that still is a very large Oof. main field. And we can see them because there's no leaves on the trees just now. So good luck to the helicopter. And oh my goodness, a walk across those fields would uh, create a lot of mud on your shoes, wouldn't it? You certainly would want to have your, your hunter's Wellington boots on, wouldn't you? This is Fletcher now. He's making a little move. They don't uh, let a man like him go off the front. And Matty Breschel has noticed that, and he comes straight across the gap for Saxo Bank. Saxo Bank looking for a new sponsor. If you have a few shillings or even dollars, then perhaps you might think of picking up the tab after this year because, sadly, Saxo Bank have announced their withdrawal from the sport. It's a very, very good team. Sylvain Chavanel is the rider up to the front for a quick step. He'll be looking after the interests of Tom Bonin a little bit later on. Radio Shack have still got a couple of their big men in there. Marcus Burkhard on the left and on the right hand side is still Gerd Stegemans. Nice to see the French teams living in Belgium. Amazingly, no French riders ever won this race. Well, it's not amazing at all, really, because it's not their sort of race, is it? Uh, do you remember Frédéric Moncassin? He did win it. He finished second in 1994. And before that, it's our old Paris-Roubaix hero, Gilbert duclos Lazal. He finished second as well back in 1981. You probably rode that year. I think I did. Yeah. I used to ride all of these races. You wouldn't have seen the, the finish, though, would you? Yeah, well, I saw it on a number of occasions. Yeah, I finished okay. in the top ten a couple of times. Good lad. Thank you. <laughs> oh, dear. Looking down from the helicopter, still the chase is on. We're now in the last 20 miles of the first real classic of the year. It's not a classic in the reputation of Liège-Bastogne-Liège or Paris-Roubaix, but in Belgium, this is a classic race, believe me. That's a Steve Chanel, the rider from B-Box there. He's been joined by a Rabobank rider. Rabobank looking for a little bit of glory from uh, Het Newsblad here this afternoon. And again, another little section of cobblestones that the riders are battering themselves over. 31 kilometres to go. That should have them at the finish line in around about 40 minutes. This is a serious move. They're taking some serious risks going around those corners. Is there any left letter in the alphabet, alphabet not used in the name of this town? Boiskenstraat or something? 31 kilometres to go. Rowlands has made his move. Good for him. He's been itching to get away all day. And now it seems without his teammate at the back and the two-time winner of this event under the banner of Het Volk, Philippe Gilbert. No well, problems at the railroad crossing, that's a bit of a relief. Yeah, well, the police are there monitoring the situation to yeah. look after the safety of the riders there. You can see the long line at the front end of the main field. One by one, those riders have slipped off and they could be forming a pretty serious group and I'd actually forgotten that these three men have still survived. Only just, there's Rollins coming through in the background. This is the Padestraat, 2.3 kilometres, a very long section of cobblestones. It's going to cause mayhem in the main field behind because I reckon you'll have men like Philippe Gilbert and Tom Bonham will be really hitting this section of cobblestones hard. Jürgen Rowlands, really, apart from his national title, which he picked up in 2008, uh, he hasn't really won uh, too much since then. He didn't get a win at all last year. He did win a stage at Tour of Poland back in 2008, but that's Bram Tankink great name for a guy who's riding at the front as he stamps on those pedals with Steve Chanel the rider at the, in the back there for team uh, B-Boxer Boyd Telecom that's what they're, they're chasing after and they're just about to make the junction here Bram Tanking an uh, interesting character he didn't start bike riding until he was about 23 years of age he was watching it on the TV and said well I think 
I think I'll have a go at this. And he started riding longer randonneur events uh, through the mountains, and he's turned out to be a very serious professional bike rider now. Well, he's got himself onto the top team of Rabobank, and that's a considerable achievement in itself. There he is. Has he got a problem? Yeah. Oh, oh front wheel. <coughs> oh, steady on. Well, he was lucky to survive that one. He was trying to indicate his front wheel. That's bad luck. Well, he, he seems to think that he's got a... Uh, oh, hit the hole too, yeah. no, flat tyre. Yeah, he seems to think that uh, one of his team mechanics might be close by here and he was just looking to see if anybody's got a wheel. The problem mm. when you're in a situation like this is the team car's way, way behind him. That's uh, bad luck for Bram Tangier. Yeah, and there's nothing you can do. He's not allowed to take a wheel off a member of the public, which he'd like to do. Let's get out of the road there, Bram, because the main field's coming along pretty yeah. fast. This is Frédéric Guédon. Oh, there's the same man with the banner. He must have moved rapidly around the course there. Neutral service for Bram Tanking. He's oh. got himself uh, his front wheel in, but he's having a hard time getting going. And there's George Hincapie just actually getting a shot off the back a fraction. Always rely on George to be in the action. This is Nick Noyens, number 64. Now, he's recovered and must have got back from that uh, flat tyre he had. And he's still uh, dodging through the people. I'm not sure whether he's, he's still he's coming going, through here. No, he's just gone past Steve Shinell. And in fact, that was Verkelen going backwards. And one of the riders was in the breakaway. So right. you can see that Nick Noyens now is making the move to the front end of this race. Guedon is starting to put a bit of pressure on everybody here. Curvers can't stay on the wheel. But on the wheel there is Rowlands. He's yep. come across the gap. And this, I think, is the fourth rider on the road, Nick Noyens. Well, if Nick gets up there, he's had a second and a win in the last couple of years in this event. Uh, not when he was riding for Rabobank, actually, but now if he can get across, that'll be real firepower. You've got to hand it to Fred, haven't you? This guy won't give up. 27 to go. Well, he's still motivated. He still uh, enjoys his racing. He still has got the burning desire in his belly to come and ride these races in the northern part of France. Well, 170-odd kilometres in the lead now for Frédéric Guédon. Well, that's Rollins there, and he's going backwards. He's just seen the express train of Nick Noyens coming through mix it then he's uh, seen fresh blood come to the front so he's going to go with him two Belgian riders two big names in the sport here in Belgium and now they need to get on that's uh, Curvers just in front and then just in front of him by about 20 meters is uh, Frederic Guedon so this is the front end of the race now Guedon not looking over his shoulder at all he really brought the hammer down the Frenchman here at 38 years of age looking back to see what damage has been done who he ascertaining the situation wondering whether or not he should sit up and wait for those riders I would suggest he sits up and waits for Nick Noyens because Noyens looks to me to have a very good set of legs on him today a little bunch reforming behind here now to be a good idea to get all these motorbikes out of the way because they're forming gaps they think they're witnessing the winning move of the race judging by the photographer's action there but you get a vacuum form there so the guys and the the Bono's and got Bono's a problem in trouble not it's sure a black wheel puncture. Yep. Do it yourself. And that's and again all the that wrong money, time. You've still got to change your own wheel. Yeah. That's uh, the wrong time to have a flat tyre as well for Bonin. And he's going to have a hard chase to get himself back into this event. Oh, he's not the only one getting in trouble when he gets back on his bike, putting his feet in. I thought that was only something that happened to me and you. <laughs> There's the... Uh, <laughs> back teammate the trying to push him on. Yeah. On the way again, we can see what happened here. More, can we? No, no there they are. Really, already stopped. Yeah, the teammate up alongside him, uh, passing him in the wheel very, very quickly. Yeah, that's a shame. In fact, it was uh, Martin Wayland who passed the wheel across to Bonin. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, psychologically, it's pretty tough at a moment like this. And now it's Kevin Devert, his teammate, pacing him back into the group here. Big effort by Kevin required. Tom seemed to be on a good day today. You might have just noticed your mate uh, Martin Vellitz there as well. He's wearing the uh, National Champions jersey. I knew, I knew jersey. Be, it wouldn't be far away. He's just making me look good again. Well done, Martin. This is Fletcher. I used to know them very well, the Vellitz twins, because they used to race uh, for Konica Minolta, a small team in South Africa. And uh, that's where they were suddenly discovered. And... Um, they learnt their English in South Africa as well. Interesting, uh, talented well, twins. Well, this is a serious little move starting to go here. Rowlands again has uh, seemed to have found his second wind. In second place there is Juan Antonio Fletcher. In the group as well, just on the back, is Philippe Gilbert. And I'm wondering if Guedon has survived. Yes, he is. He's so amazing. Guedon is on the back end of the bus. He's absolutely amazing. And now he must be wondering, what on earth am I doing here? This train is really moving. Only 25 to go. And he's still not in the peloton. He left them at 10 kilometres out today. Six riders now 
Couldn't quite spot the rider in there from Rabobank, but they've got themselves a very well, serious gap all of a sudden. Get on. What a surprise that would be, but then all his victories have been surprises. He's a very, very much an opportunist cyclist. Rachel over to the left, champion Pe of Denmark. Pe Looks Pe like Pozzato. we've got to, I was say, we've got the champion of Italy here now, which is Felipe Pozzato. Yep, and this is Tom Bonin trying to drag himself back into the race. He's in not got too many uh, friends there, has he? No, a case of do it yourself by the look of it, Tom. He's in Belgium, that'll help inspire him. We've got a Radio Shack rider dropping back. Katusha Man is just tagged in here as well. That's uh, Guy Ivanov. That's the group, is Martin that the group Bellic, just up front? That's the group that they're trying to get to. Bonin's got to do all of this on his own. Looking over, is anybody going to help me? No, well, I'll do it myself. Yeah. Mm. I think this group's got a chance of getting back here. 15 miles to go, 24 kilometres. Big Gregory Rast there from Radio Shack 124, formerly uh, champion of uh, Switzerland. A big man for Team Radio Shack for the Tour de France, one of the big workers. Absolutely. Come across from Astana well, with Lance Armstrong and the rest. Looks like uh, Noyens has gone off the back of this group. Well, well the front, he's certainly not here. He's there. I think he's behind. Just yeah. there. No, has he got a problem? I think he's probably got a mechanical problem. So this is looking like a very serious workmanlike group now. Gilbert will be very happy with this situation. Juan Antonio Fletcher will work in any group that he can get into on a day like this. Well, I must say, this is going to set this trend for the rest of the year 2010. There's been some extremely good cycling this year, this day, and uh, plenty of attacking riding. We've got a lot of interest in the peloton this year with the new teams as well, like Radio Shack and Sky. And that is Nick Noyens, yeah, and he's back got a wheel. back wheel. Well, that's a shame because he works so hard. Not been his day, it's his second back wheel puncture that we know of. Uh, philosophical about it by the look of it at least he was in the right place when it happened so he's made his move for the day I think the tough thing about being in a breakaway when it's got 20 or 30 seconds at the main field is usually uh, the cars are a long way behind it, as much as uh, one and a half minutes and Noyan's yeah. got his hand up but there's not even any neutral service in there which is a bit of a surprise because there are motorbike neutral vehicles which uh, they should have had in there because there are enough motorbikes in there and really they shouldn't be let's face it Fletcher He's looking to uh, see what he can do this afternoon for Team Sky, but you know, Gilbert is a man looking to be on a mission this afternoon. He's looking to see whether or not he can get himself another victory in this event. Case of if you're a betting man, down the bookies now because Gilbert has got himself in the right position. Bad luck for Nick Noyens. He needed a result too, I think. Nothing he can do. It must be a slow puncture. He's still riding on it. Yeah, it's flattening, but you know, with yeah, these roads going it. left and right the way they do, it's uh, very difficult to keep upright it's at speeds dead of flat. 45, 50. Dead flat. He'll have no wheel left if he keeps bouncing on these cobblestones like that. Oh, there you can see. Yes, he can't move. He's, he's just completely flat. His rim's scooting all over the place. He's not going to be a very happy camper this evening when Neither's he gets the mechanic to when he sees the state of this back wheel. <laughs> Nothing he can do, he's going to have to let this group go by him as well and hope that there are some service just behind. Well, you can, you can see now Team Cervelo test team coming to the front. They're the team that missed out. They were very attentive early on and Heinrich Hauser, I think, will be kicking himself because he'd been in almost every split that had happened so far. And now he's seen a, a group going off the front end of the main field. I'm looking to see if Tom Bonin has managed to get into that group. If he has, he's probably still sitting at the back. All that training, all that attacking, and you still can't beat the puncture. And uh, he's really struggling to hold that bike. He can't go round corners on it just now. Well, this is the this is the tough thing about oh these dear. kind of races in Belgium. When the race starts to split up, the team cars could be a long, long way behind, and he's still waiting. There'll be another group behind, and I expect yep. that will be the group of Tom Bonin. So that means that the Belgian champion hasn't got himself back into this race yet. No, he hasn't. I don't see him there. That's another group. That's really bad luck, but as you say, Paul, there, there are new, there's Tom. There are neutral services. He can't even get round the corner at all now. He's just keeping his balance. There's neutral service on motorbikes, and I don't see any of them. Plenty of other motorbikes. Well, there's Bonin, still trying to drag himself back into this race. How luck changes. Martin Velitz is in there as well. He's uh... acceleration of Tom here just ripped off the front of the peloton as he just crosses the gap to that next group. There's the peloton, he says, and that's what I'm duty-bound to reach. 
Yeah, but once he's reached that group, he's still got to leapfrog again uh, a little bit further forward because there's another main group in front of that one, while the leading group now is starting to uh, consolidate a fairly big advantage at 25 seconds. He's found a teammate he's again. A friend at the side of the road. And he gets the team change. Yeah, Thomas Laser passing the wheel across there but uh, that's going to be a blow to Nick Noyens' morale because he was in what could possibly be a winning move and now he's got to try and get himself back into the main field this is the Kopf van der Weegstrijd down to five riders with that mechanical to Nick Noyens Gilbert and Rolands, Guedon still in here as well as Fletcher and uh, Kervis on a bit of a ride himself this afternoon for Skill Shimano he certainly is, he's looking tired but he's in there so too is uh, and has a right to look tired Frederick Guedon nobody can complain if they can't put the work rate in right now but look at Curvis he's going through again well this is a good move for Farmer Lotto because they have got uh, the advantage of having two riders in this breakaway and an extremely strong on form Philippe Gilbert and the backup of well of uh, Jürgen Roelands who can help him out on the running towards the finish nice new Cannondale for the new season for the Lotto boys Just see on the shoulder on the elbow there of um Philippe Gilbert filled the, uh, the blood from when he came in down in that corner a little while back. Mm. Again, another little cobblestone section. This will start to weaken the riders. This is the Langemont, 2.5 kilometres long. Ob de Cassea, as they say in Flemish, on top of the cobblestones. Yes, thankfully, they still look a bit greasy, but I don't think they are. I think they're OK. This is a good workmanlike group here. Fletcher on a new team, of course and keeping Sky in the frame but uh, very good one of the few Spanish cyclists who can ride the one day classics well Fletcher one of the first riders uh, to, to be signed up by Team Sky and there was a whole lot of uh, rumour mongering going around at the Tour de France that they had managed to sign him up this is Tor Hushoft doing the pacemaking on the front mm. for Cervelo test team so Phil I think maybe Tor is not in great form himself today he will be dedicating himself for Heinrich Hausler trying to repair the damage Hausler was in his slipstream there there's been uh, some pretty fit guys in this race though today and they're not giving up. There's two pelotons here at the moment. Yeah, Bowman I think should be in that one somewhere. Noyens was just on the back of that group, uh, number we're 64. Well. He had to wait a long time to get that wheel passed across to him by a teammate. And now this is the work being done by Cervelo Test Team. Uh, three riders from Cervelo Test Team at the front end of the main field and there's the official 20 kilometres to go banner. Oh, our director's done a good job, he agrees. 20 kilometres to go, 31 seconds. And still two survivors of the original four in this breakaway, in Curvis and in uh, Guedon. And they're both still working with these three newcomers to the front. Gilbert, two-time winner. No Spanish cyclist has ever won uh, this event. We're now looking at around about 25 kilometres, 25 minutes to go to the finish line. They have an attack going. Looks yes, like it it's is. Philippe Gilbert. This is the way he's won Het Volk in Absolutely. the past. He's attacked all the cobblestones, he's thrown everything at them. And that acceleration now is just a little bit too much for Curva, a little bit too much for Frederic Guedon. Now, that's not too much of a surprise. And they won't get any help from Jurgen Rolands because, well, there we go. He's decided to go himself because well, he, he realizes these two guys have spent forces. Yeah, get across the gap there. Fletcher, by the way, is the best ever Spanish cyclist in this event. He finished second back in 2007, and he's chasing now the winner. A couple of times, Fletcher's gone. Huge effort. How did that happen? He just accelerated. He looked at the motorbike in front of him. He accelerated on the cobblestones, and he's put Philippe Gilbert into a spot of bother here. Well, I don't think Gilbert be too happy about the proximity of the motorbike, but he's gone now, and the gap has opened. Gilbert is having to go. This is when he might be paying now for the chase back efforts of the earlier problems he's had and there is a quite a strong wind blowing now seeing the flag on the right and it's coming across the course just now 28 seconds back to the main group but it's around about three or four seconds to Philippe Gilbert now Fletcher now cannot think about doing anything else but really burying himself he's got to give it hundred ten percent now because this is a last ditch do or die effort I seem to remember uh, Gilbert when he won uh, the first time he won from a breakaway on his own 50 kilometers out now Fletcher's gone at just inside 20 kilometers to go he sensed the breakaway was getting a little bit tired they're not very far ahead of the peloton it seems to be totally preoccupied with the problems of its own back there with punctures and chase backs that 
He may have sensed that now is the time or never. Well, the acceleration came originally from Philippe Gilbert. He put the hard acceleration in on the cobbles and he probably felt, Fletcher probably felt that he could uh, feel a weakening in Philippe Gilbert. He just went straight past him. He didn't really attack. He just accelerated slowly but surely. Well, whichever way you look at it, it's a fine piece of publicity for the new British team Sky right now. As there are all sorts of rumours, I think a lot of them are a load of rubbish about how much money is in this team. Multi, multi millions of pounds or dollars. And uh, I don't think they're that true, but even so, they've managed to buy a very good team and put it together. Not the team, as I said earlier, I think they want finally. Uh, but they're on the ladder now, and as other rides become available this year, they'll no doubt strengthen it. Uh, but they're doing a very good season already. They shot to the fore with a win by Greg Henderson on the very first day of the season in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's continued. And I do have, uh, I do hear through the grapevine that Mr Murdoch's son, who runs uh, one of his companies, is a very keen cycling fan and is uh, going to take an active part in following the races around Europe this year, and I'm sure we'll see them at the Tour de France later in the season. Let's hope so, and uh, the team will, I'm sure, make the tour. It's an important team, I think, for the organisation as well. 18 kilometres to go, Gilbert's off the cobblestones and settling back in, but he's got his gun sights firmly set down the road now as he watches one of the few Spanish cyclists in the world who can tame the Belgian roads, and he's gone. Well, there's the gap. It's around about 100 metres, and now Gilbert has just got to get himself concentrated now, just get down to the job in hand and see whether or not he can pull himself back. These are the next two riders on the road, the Guedon having to do all the pacemaking, and he won't get all that much help from uh, Jürgen Rolands. He doesn't need to pull back Philippe Gilbert, but look at that. For 38 years of age, that guy from France there, he's doing a great job. 27 kilometres... Uh, he went away at 10k, we're now 17 from the finish. He's been virtually in the lead the whole way today, uh, Fred Guedon. And he's still up there with the chance of a real high finish. That's Philippe Gilbert, twice a winner. May have to be content with second just at the moment, because uh, that's a looking like a very strong Spanish cyclist down that. Juan Antonio Fletcher. He dreams of winning Paris-Roubaix or the Ronde van Vlaanderen, the best Spanish rider in uh, either of those events. And he, at the moment, is looking to see whether or not he can write his name onto the uh, Palmarès or the history books of Het Newsblad. Being chased by Philippe Gilbert, Gilbert will be very angry with this. He's the man who set up the move originally, but then all of a sudden Juan Antonio Fletcher of Spain went straight over the top of him and just dropped him like a stone. With no doubt he loves this race, Fletcher. He's had a second, he's had a third, and uh, so the next logical step is first, I guess. Well, that's what he thinks, 16 kilometres to go. This has been a very good race route, though, today. It's a much harder race now, the new sponsorship. Well, previously, when it finished uh, in uh, Loker, and the, the climbs were much too far from the finish to be uh, of any real importance to the race, but now that they've been able to move it back to Ghent, it just makes it that little bit more aggressive in the uh, middle part of the race. Well, in fact, Gilbert is not going anywhere. He's about to get caught here by his own teammate and by Frédéric Guédon, so that would indicate that Gilbert is not in one of his best days. The second group is now, they're saying, at 28 seconds. You know, just looking at Fletcher's record, he's had a second, third, fourth and sixth in Paris-Roubaix. He's been placed in the Tour de Flanders. That's why we say he's one of the few Spanish cyclists who can actually ride these bad roads of Belgium in an alien climate at this time of the year for a Spanish cyclist. Uh, but he speaks English. He's not your normal Spanish cyclist, really, is he? And he's got himself a top British team now where he seems to be very happy. And I know the team will be cheering today and I hope he survives because this will be a huge feather in the new team's cap. And another thing as well, it's very rare for Spanish riders to expatriate themselves. They're normally much more comfortable riding at home on Spanish teams and very few are the Spanish riders who've gone to different teams. And Juan Antonio Fletcher, as you said, yes, has pretty much uh, lived most of his career riding in uh, English-speaking teams. Well, I guess paella is much nicer than fish and chips, isn't it? Absolutely. He'd be looking to a paella this afternoon if he can. He's uh, looking at him on the left-hand side there. He's got the he's got the power. He's got a great pedaling cadence there, and he's looking very aggressive on his bike. He now knows he has got a very good chance of winning this bike race. It's 30 seconds down to the second group there with Philippe Gilbert, and 45 seconds back to the main field. That's still a very small spread. Uh, but they are running out of kilometres to do something about it. We've still got the climb of the wall, don't forget. It uh, can be so decisive and it's a 
pretty much a flat run into the finish but it's a hard charge 15 kilometers that's all that's left to ride daunting prospect he's taking a gamble here Fletcher he hasn't won this race by any manner of means yet 30 seconds that chase group and uh, only a 46 second sped and the clouds are staying up there a little bit of rain on the right the second group on the road here team manager coming up a well in fact it's the the tight Ooh. sky team car going forward and he obviously feels that this is a good moment now that he's been given permission to go forward by the race referees 30 seconds to Gilbert but that group there Phil does not seem to have the firepower as we pull back we get a chance to see the spread there is Juan Antonio Fletcher it's pretty much flat now all the way down towards the finish line working very very hard here those long thin legs he's really burying himself now he knows that this is uh, there's no holding anything back at all this is the best position to be in a bike race like this on your own against the clock against the elements knowing that uh, you don't have to hold anything back and think about the sprint finish towards the end just making sure that you keep building on that advantage or at least consolidate and he stretch it out to 41 seconds Cervelo test team now are at the front end of the main field big Tor Hushoff the god of thunder is the man doing the most of the pacemaking there and Scott Sunderland in the team car there he's having a quick chat he knows all about racing in this part of the world because he himself lives uh, just down the road not far from Brackle popular place to live in Brackle if you're, if you're a Belgian pro or even if you're an Australian pro it's also the home of uh, Robbie McEwen this man is Scott killing himself Sunderland in the car there He's killing himself. He's out of the saddle all the time. It's as if uh, everything that he can do, he's throwing into it. Scotty knows that this is the moment. He knows he's got to keep the pressure on, keep psychologically helping your rider there. Yes, 38 again. seconds. Scott Sunderland coming across from uh, Saxo Bank to be the top man on the squad here to look after the Sky team on the road. And the Aussie there, also well settled in Belgium has a Belgian wife he speaks the language fluently and he's hoping now to cheer a big victory here for Sky well uh, to add on to the victories that they got in the early part of the year in uh, races like uh, the Cancer Classic in Adelaide this would be a big feather in their cap especially looking towards the Tour de France and selection later on in the year Fletcher sweeping around that bend you know it's not a done deal just yet at 36 seconds I'm more concerned about the main field at 49 seconds because in that group with big men like Tor Hushoff organizing the chase for Heinrich Hausler this man could find himself getting caught inside the final kilometers well, I have to say that in fact uh, Fletcher here is really taking a big gamble because they're not letting him go he's, he's really worked hard to squeeze out another six seconds uh, these boys are just about hanging on they're only 12 seconds in front of the peloton surely they're going to get picked up now and 12 kilometers to go to the finish and still we have uh, Gedon tagged on to the back he's done a great ride uh, the only survivor now of that early morning breakaway of four riders mm. and still looking fairly good the main field there just coming around that same corner it's uh, only a spread now of around about 10 seconds these guys here from Cervelo Test Team, Phil, that looks like Roger Hammond on the front. It He's is. doing the pacemaking. These riders from Cervelo Test Team, this is all for Heinrich Hausler. Hammond also another rider I think that Sky would have liked to have taken on board because he is a man for the classics as well. He's been on the podium in Paris-Roubaix. Real workhorse as he rides for Cervelo here and he's putting a lot of weight behind these pedals but they're not making a big impression. Bernie just 11 Eisel. seconds 10 seconds now he's getting closer to these three anyway well Bernie Eisel right up at the front end of the main field there as well in about fourth or fifth position for HTC Columbia he's a guy who if it all comes back together at the end will have a very good chance in the sprint because he doesn't have to look after Mark Cavendish this afternoon good point Mark Cavendish wrestling with his teeth at just at the moment and seems to have had a bad time of it so he hopes to ride Milan San Remo but the question is, will he be on form to win it again? We'll find out, won't we? 12 kilometres left. Well, most people are saying that Cavendish is probably around about a month behind in his preparation uh, this year. But let's not forget, it's a long way down to the start of the Tour de France. This man now is really battling. You can, you can see the fact that he's rolling the top half of his body. He's trying to get every last little bit of energy from somewhere to keep that bike going forward. He's at 12 kilometres to go and he's still hovering at that 36 seconds. But if the main field catches that group of three in the middle, we're going to see a change in the tactics at the front end and the sprinters will all of a sudden start to think, wow, we can win this race. Fletcher starting his 11th season as a professional. That's a terrific length of time to be a top pro like he has been. 
and uh, will be 33 years of age in September very close to Lance Armstrong's birthday actually about two days different yeah, Armstrong uh, so 18th of September 1971 Jens Voigt the 17th of September 1971 oh, same day as Jens Voigt then for a slight difference in the age about five or six years never mind yeah but Jens Voigt uh, uh, Lance Armstrong is always very happy when he participates in a race that Jens Voigt is in because he yeah. says at least I'm not the oldest by a day a little bit of a building on the right going on but not so much building on the road I'm afraid because the gap is still holding now at 11 seconds between there as we look down the road they're just about coming round that corner they'll be looking to survive these three at 10 kilometers to go but amazing. will Fletcher survive it's amazing to see that Gedon has still got the firepower to help those two guys from Farmer Lotto who are at the front end of this group this is Hammond followed there by big tour hush off to Bernie Eisel there in fourth position a little bit further back there is Marcus Seaberg I have to say that Hammond looks to be absolutely flying yet the clock is telling us he's getting no closer well I think everybody's extremely tired there's the three riders that they're chasing after and Hammond is really putting a massive big turn another rider who lives in Belgium speaks extremely good Flemish as well Had a third place finish in Paris-Roubaix a couple of years ago Yes, he does all his interviews in the local language, which is uh, good for an Englishman, I must say. It uh, makes him popular. Marcus Burkhardt there moving up for BMC as well, a former winner of Ghent Wavelgem. That's the quarry. Those are the three riders they're looking for. And uh, Gedon, hat off to that man at 38 years of age. Uh, he's been at the front of this race now for around about 190 kilometres. Amazing. Is this rider going to be at the front of the race though at the finish? Juan Antonio Fletcher, the archer, as his name implies. And he's going straight as an arrow towards the finish now. Nine kilometres to go. He hasn't altered at all. 36, 37 seconds. He's locked in, but he's not catching him. Oh, he's gone away by a second. Well, that second might be all that counts at the end. Uh, he's almost always in sight now because we're coming to not far from the outskirts of Ghent. The roads are very wide and open and the main field can see the three riders just in front of them, but they can also just about ascertain what the position is of Juan Antonio Fletcher. 38 seconds, just showing group number two. And the other boys are almost on a final effort by Roger Hammond and the boys. Somebody's just pedaling off the front there. It's got to be curtains now for these three or maybe just the strong men will reach them eight kilometers to go we're ticking them off kilometer by kilometer looks like quick step is it down there trying to bridge with skill shimano I think. Oh, it is indeed Philippe skill Gilbert, shimano, yeah. Rolands and uh, Guedon about to get caught but there's a little bit of a scurrying on at the front end of the main field as well because it's still pretty well organized by Roger Hammond and Tor Hushoft making sure that they slowly and surely peg these men back but well, once they've caught these they've still got to go after Fletcher that was a superhuman effort by the rider from skill Shimano it might be to no avail because now he's so tired he can't help the three leaders pull away they're all looking at each other and it's going to be coming back together then they're going to round out at 41 seconds he's nibbled on a couple of more seconds at seven kilometers to go now they need to keep themselves organized to get on looking over his shoulder he's had a, a long hard race today uh, hats off for him it has been an excellent job that really was a huge effort now his teammates launched here Frederick did he get on remember the name he's not a rising star that's for sure people put Zato coming to the fore now but uh, what seems to have happened is there's a lack of organization and that will be good for Fletcher if they want to pull him back at this point there needs to be a team who's going to dedicate themselves to organizing the chase on the front end of this group that's the only way to pull him back and he will now at seven kilometers to go start to feel a little bit comfortable with 41 seconds advantage you can tell by the way the riders are riding here now the following wheels there's no firepower left in the group and this man is just getting on with his job now and hoping there's no further reaction at 41 seconds he has a realistic chance of winning this now just six kilometers to go less than four miles to the finish there's a superhuman effort required from the peloton now and it's got to be organized it's no good spinning off the front and then sitting up and then spinning off the front. There's got to be a concerted chase here. Yes, because that kind of uh, tactics actually slows down the overall average speed and that will turn the advantage towards the man at the front. 
Frederic Guedon right at the back end of the group now. Oh, Heinrich Hausler coming to the front here. Down amongst the traffic, the lonely figure of the new team, Sky, but, uh, an old hand at the game, been a pro since the year 2000. That's all that's left of a very tenacious peloton today. It has been a tough race. Anybody that finishes in that group will have to have worked very, very hard indeed. Actually, just looking at that uh, gap we that's got there from Hansler. the the gap we got from the helicopter there, Phil, did not look like a 40-second gap to me. It was uh, closer to 30. Now, Heinrich Hausler, he has got the legs. The team have done a lot of work to bring him as close as possible to Juan Antonio Fletcher. Now he's seen his opportunity on what was uh, a mountain of a railway bridge, and he's gone off the gap, and he's got to chase down to this man. Five kilometres is all he's got left if he's going to bridge the gap. Well, he's not noted as the world's best time trialist and he's got five kilometres to bridge three quarters of a minute and I don't think that's possible, in all honesty. 42 seconds now, he's nibbling. The good thing about the running to Ghent is we're in the suburbs, you're changing direction, you've got the houses, you're out of sight. It's not like the open plains of Flanders where they can see you and the carrot is dangling, so the chances that uh, Fletcher's made a very good decision to go away from that breakaway. Well, Andreas Clear is in this group for Cervelo Test Team as well. They'll be quite happy with the situation because they've got the one man that they wanted to off the front of the main field. But you could see in that peloton, Phil, or what was left of it, there certainly is no organisation at all. House Le Clear, as we've gone under that five kilometre to go banner, 43 seconds is the spread from the peloton, not to House Le, I would presume. So House Le's a little bit closer. He might be riding around 37 seconds behind. There's a chance here. Well, he knows exactly what he has to do, but uh, he really has to lift the pace. This man, though, does not look like a man who's going to weaken. He no. keeps looking up at those banners. Now it's only four kilometres to go, and he's still got three quarters of a minute advantage. That seemed like a very fast kilometre. Banners close together, maybe. Who cares, because this man's going to be very pleased with that. Four kilometres, two and a half miles, and there's no way you can bridge 42 seconds in two and a half miles unless you're Fabian Cancellara or somebody. Hausler, though has thrown down the gauntlet here it looks as though it's been a good test day for him a Cervelo test day for him and uh, he's actually just in the sights of the main field there keeps looking under his uh, shoulder to see whether or not he has the gap this man is killing himself his body is shouting out to stop because the pain has been with him since the 19 to kilometers to go sign and now he knows that every kilometer that he ticks by he's closer to getting himself that very historic victory just let me smell the air Yep, that was the River Shelder I think we just crossed as we're now heading in towards Ghent and this is Hausler and they've still got him in the sights. He's not going to get away, is he? No, he's not getting across the gap at all there. There's a little move again at the front end from uh, Quickstep. I think that's probably Sylvain Chavanel. We don't know where Tom Boonen is this afternoon. I have a feeling Boonen may well have crept himself back into that group. But it's been a tough day for a lot of the big names in the sport. Philippe Gilbert has been on the ground. He's had a flat tyre. Now, the precarious part of Ghent now, ah. in the side streets, uh, dodging the tram lines. Three kilometres to go. Ah, it's a vibrant city, is Ghent. The best Belgian beer, the best French fries and the best tram lines. 38 seconds, three kilometres now. This is when you sort of will him on and want him to succeed. A man that took the gamble when he did, he sensed that breakaway, wasn't going to be good enough. At 19 kilometres to go, did he want to go then or did he just take his moment? Either way, it looks like Fletcher is about to become the first Spanish winner of this race. Well, taking risks, he's got to keep the tempo up. He's using all of the road possible. Uh, well, we're on the uh, nasty little cobblestones in the middle of Ghent now. Next banner you'll see is two kilometres and then he may well just be able to breathe a sigh of relief. But that time, Phil, is now starting to come down quite quickly. It's down to 35 seconds. Touch and go. With three kilometres, surely they can't, uh, they can't bridge 35 seconds in such a short distance now. He's got to watch he doesn't get a flat tyre, especially on these cobblestones. They bang those tyres to pieces. They get what they call snake bites on the back of the rim and down they go. That would be a total injustice right now for the man in black and a big, big win for the new team, Sky. Hausler halfway across the gap, uh, just looking behind him there, it looked as if the main field had uh, been broken by Heinrich Hausler, but I don't think he's going to bridge the gap to this man because he is going round these corners like a man possessed at two kilometres to go. That's around about two minutes and 20 seconds for Ooh. this man to get to the finish. Just about got that car on the corner there, that's a rather nasty turn, but anyway, we're into the back streets of the city of Ghent now in Belgium, and uh, the Het Newsblad 
This man's uh, always been on the podium since he's been sponsored by Hit Newsblad, but never in first place. This time it looks like it's going to be first place. Two kilometres out looking for the banner now. One kilometre to go. He's not far away. In fact, that looks like it, is it? Yes, that's one kilo. That two. Oh, that's two kilometres, yes, because Housler's underneath the banner now, that's right. Well, he's quite a long way behind, that's all of 31 seconds. I would put Housler at around about 20 seconds, and it's uh, 31 seconds back to the main field. This is the main field, so they're right on the coattail of Heinrich yeah. Housler. He's just about hanging in there. It's a brave attack by Heinrich, and I just can't understand why they're not coming out to take him so close to the finish because they're preoccupied there's no way they're going to catch him now these little bridges here on the outskirts of Ghent by the railway station he knows now he's virtually at the finishing line he'll look for the 1k banner there it is just a thousand meters to the finish and he really deserves this one in the true spirit of the old Hep Volk race on your own just like Philippe Gilbert once did that's going to be a wonderful sight, strung as high as you like. Hope they got planning permission for that. I just think at the moment, Phil, that he's thrown the style book out of the window here because he's all over his bike. He's uh, ducking and diving his body. The top half of his shoulders are rocking and rolling as if he's really trying to bury himself for this last moment. But now he's going to start to breathe a sigh of relief. He hasn't looked over his shoulders to check, but he's still looking on it around about a 25-second advantage over the front end of the main field. And he'll look round every one of these corners waiting to see the finish line banner. I must say the organisers done a good job to get us around the back streets of Ghent here to avoid all of the tram lines as we head towards the finish so after twice finishing second and once last year finishing third it now looks like the top spot for Juan Antonio Fletcher and what a memorable win this is and he still will not stop getting out of the saddle battling with machine he is burying himself as they say in Liverpool at the moment he's all over that bike but very shortly he will be able to smile and the pain will go away he's never looked round oh, now he does just underneath his arm to make sure there's no wheels sneaking up on those barriers and uh, most certainly not today Peter van Pietergen looking out the window there behind he's done this before as he now comes home to victory and that is a terrific win not just for Juan Antonio Fletcher but for the Sky Cycling team as well they are very much on the block. He might well have signed the position. There's the arrow. He's the Fletcher. There's the team. Now bring on the Tour de France. Great ride by Juan Antonio Fletcher. Now this looks like Heinrich Hausler. He's just about survived. In fact, he's not because he's been no. overtaken there. He has been overtaken. Are they going to get a 1-2? But where has Hausler found the legs from? The sprinter who finished second last year, Milan San Remo. Oh, he's just going to beat uh, Tyler Ferrar there. So he gets second. Uh, there for Heinrich, third was Ferrar. It looked like the Aqua Saponi rider must have been Paolini and I think Marcel Seberg from HTC Column. There's Dave Brailsford, the man behind the new Sky team. First on site to congratulate him, first big win. And uh, he's pretty happy about that. I'm not surprised at all. As I said, there's all these rumours of millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Brailsford said it's all rubbish. Uh, but there's no doubt there's a couple of million in there let's face it uh, it's not cheap sponsoring there's uh, the pro teams there's the famous the launching of the arrow because his name means the maker of an arrow Fletcher well he's he's tried Phil for many many years to get himself a victory in this part of the world he's tried in the Tour of Flanders he's tried in this race he's tried in Paris-Roubaix and finally he's got that victory the the cobblestone classic that he's looked for for many many years <laughs> there's the welcoming committee Sky are in big time that's a way to start the European cycling season they threatened it in the Tour Down Under confirmed it here in Belgium is this Hushoff coming in last year's winner yeah he's had a hard time yeah, he did a lot of work for the team in the uh, last few kilometres to get that second place finish for Heinrich Hausler and that's a pretty impressive sprint finish Phil, because he rode the last five or six kilometres full on in the wind Yes, he did, and how on earth he, he must have got caught literally with a few yards to go, and he kept he kept the momentum up before the others could sprint him. Big moments then for Juan Antonio Fletcher. Even at 32 years of age, he's put the team on the map. But what a tremendous uh, performance he has! If you look at his palmarès in this part of Belgium over the years, it is outstanding. Sixth in Paris Bay, third in this race last year, third in the Tour of Flanders. He's been second twice in this event, and he's had endless places on the podium in Paris Bay. So this is his part of the world right now. See if we can show you the result as we 
fan around still coming in very important the riders who are dropped towards the end of these classics do complete the distance they need this long longer racing at this time of the year ready for the classics which will follow remember that this year Gent Wavelgum is not held midweek it'll be held on the Sunday it's a new course it's much harder there was talk of it going out to the classic distance of 260 kilometers but they've uh, relented on that at least and so uh, that'll also clash sadly with the weekend the Critérium International in France that'll take some of the riders away a different type of rider really for the two races aren't they they certainly are but this man is definitely a man for the cobbles and a, definitely a man for the races in the north of France and Belgium and uh, Holland and finally after so many years after such a long <laughs> campaign there he goes Fletcher show me your bow just before he took his arrow out the quiver there he made just one more check to make sure nobody was sneaking up on him I don't think you can believe it actually as he uh, comes up to the finish line looking for his team manager there and Brailford's done a great job for Br British cycling over the last few years and here's the remnants of the main field the riders who uh, have got left behind there uh, mm. just looking to see which group Tom Bona there he is just sitting at the back he never made it back into this race yes that's uh, that's uh, Matty Breschel a champion Denmark also finishing in this group Bona was unlucky he was immensely strong today a little wry smile on his face beaten by the elements at the end of the day and he just couldn't chase back anymore there's the canals down here in the center of Ghent some serious renovations in the, the heart of Ghent nowadays it's become uh, an incredibly beautiful tourist that village. crane has been there Paul since 1966 Paul many congratulations a terrific victory can you first flash back to the the final cobblestone hey. sections uh, what happened there with Philip Schilbert well thank you very much what happened well uh, just bad attack and uh, was a little bit side win and uh, well he attacked when I was already right in the front but I wasn't riding full there and uh, I stay in the width of Gilbert and then from the car they say go I mean go now now is good moment and since there I didn't look back again till 100 meters to go here how big of a relief is this you were so close so many times in so many classics yeah it's really emotional for me as you say I've been knocking on the door many times and sometimes like today you you show that just keep on trying and one day it will come and the victory came in a thing beautiful beautiful way the emotion is obvious and of course a very big win for your brand new team Sky yeah I want to dedicate this victory to them to the whole team to Matthew Hyman, he gave his back wheel to me when I had a flat tire before the Eichenberg. And from the Scott and Stephen De Jong, they were in the car, incredible. But I want to give a, a little small part of this victory to Frank van der Broek. It's my first victory in Belgium, and today I remember him a lot. And I saw Nico Matan this morning, and I said that today I was going to be racing for Frank. So that's what I pointed to the to the sky there. The sky is my team, but I'm sure Frank is there too. So thanks to to everybody and part of these victories to him. Thanks very much. Respect. Yes, well said indeed. The Juan Antonio Fletcher, his friend Frank Vandenbroek, who, as we know, took his own life last year and sadly missed. Very troubled person indeed. But this rider today, well. The motto is, if at first you don't succeed, keep on trying, because in the end, victory comes. I was surprised when he said it's actually his very first victory in Belgium. I must confess, I hadn't realized that, but what a way to start after all those seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixth, and seventh places he's had in the classics races. Tyler Farrar, oaring well there for Garmin. Uh, transitions, getting on the podium. Uh, so his form is coming nicely. He'll be uh, looking towards the Tour of Italy this year, at least, and then probably the Tour de France. Also interesting to know that he wasn't himself without bad luck on this race because he uh, explaining there that Matty yeah. Heyman had passed across the back wheel to him. And if that hadn't happened, you see, you can't win a bike race unless you've got a good, strong team to support you. And I'll tell you what, Heinrich Hausler should be very, very pleased with his performance today because although he got second on the day, it was the way he rode the race. He really put out a lot of energy today throughout the race and he still got second place. So he must be very, very pleased with his return to the top flight. 
There's the podium, Fletcher, Heinrich Hausler, Tyler Farrar, all names we know an awful lot about and it looks like they've been working hard during the winter to be back on the podiums again. Yeah, great performance by the American there because uh, he's making a name for himself as much more than just a, a bunch sprinter because riding third in a race like a Het Newsblad is an indication that you are starting to become a very serious one-day classics rider and he doesn't look too worse for wear, does he? <laughs> well, he's looking at that trophy as if he doesn't know whether he should be drinking or jumping through it, but... Uh, He's happy enough now, finally gets the top spot. A huge crowd, we can't see them, but there's a huge crowd looking in on this presentation here in the centre of Ghent. Is, is that the Waters line down there, Waters Plain, Paul? Is that what they call it? Yep, they've got a very, very big uh, water, water centre here in Ghent yeah. where they do a lot of uh, rowing. And uh, that looks like uh, Ghent Plage. They're obviously co copying Paris these days. Yeah, nice little beach. Uh, I wouldn't be going down there topless today, I must confess. It's rather cold. Some of the action out on the course, as Paul said, we didn't know he had that flat tyre, but he got back in. It's always Matty Heyman, the brilliant super domestic of the world of cycling. He's come across from Rabobank to ride on Team Sky. He's going to be a great asset. This is where he made the winning move. That was the move, and that was the brave move at 19 kilometres to go, to, to go it alone, especially when you're with a strong guy like Philippe Gilbert. But obviously, the wings were on the shoulders of Juan Antonio Fletcher this afternoon. Right, well, we're ad-libbing our way to the results, I hope. Oh, yes, we are. There they are. There is the full list of the top ten finishes. Pozzato, champion of Italy, getting tenth place. Eisel in eighth place, another sprinter for later. Seberg on the attack today, he gets fifth. Uh, the top three, we already know. So, that's the first big Belgian classic under our belts. Omloop Het Nieuwsblad 2010. We'll be back for the rest of the season, bringing you all of the best here on World Cycling Productions. Until then, goodbye.